Well, good morning and welcome to the 12th meeting in 2015 of the Rural Affairs, Climate Change and Environment Committee. Before we move to the first item, let me remind everyone that their mobile phones should be switched on to silent at least, as they can affect the broadcasting system, and that committee members will be using tablets in some cases uh, for the uh, meeting papers in digital format. We have apologies today from uh, Graham Day, and we welcome Christian Allard uh, to the meeting in his place. Um, agenda item one on Scottish Government's biodiversity strategy, and this is for us to take evidence uh, from the Minister and her officials. Uh, welcome Aileen MacLeod, uh, with uh, Connell, uh, Keith Connell, Deputy Director of Natural Resources, Scottish Government, <laughs> Sally Thomas, Land Use and Biodiversity Team Leader, in the Scottish Government, and uh, Des, Professor Des Thompson, Principal Advisor on Biodiversity to Scottish Natural Heritage. Welcome to you all. Um, I don't know whether you wish to make any opening remarks, Minister. I do, the convener, Thank if you. that's OK. Well, please. Um, well, convener, can I um, just start by thanking you again for the invitation to come to the committee this morning to discuss Scotland's biodiversity and for the opportunity for me to make some brief uh, opening remarks. Now, I very much welcome the committee's ongoing interest in Scotland's biodiversity, which I think everyone would acknowledge presents both opportunities and challenges. Since the committee last met to consider this subject, we have published the 2020 Challenge for Scotland's Biodiversity, which updated and complements Scotland's Biodiversity Strategy published in 2004. And we are very close to publishing Scotland's Biodiversity, a route map to 2020. And I am delighted to have been able to share with the committee a final pre-publication draft of the route map on which I would be extremely happy to receive your thoughts prior to its publication uh, next month. As you know, convener, I am always keen to hear uh, the committee's views and have your input, and especially when it comes to an issue like this, given your expertise and knowledge. Now, the route map sets out six big steps for nature and a number of priority collaborative projects which the Scottish Government and a wide range of partners are taking forward to improve the state of nature in Scotland and help towards meeting the ACCI goals and targets. Now, the six big steps cover issues such as ecosystem restoration and wildlife conservation and the provision of quality green space for health and education. The route map also recognises the importance of a range of biodiversity related work that is focused on particular places and areas, working at a landscape scale and on a collaborative basis and involving public agencies, local authorities, NGOs and others. Now, I'm aware that the committee heard something about the opportunities of such work at the roundtable with stakeholders and Scottish Government delivery bodies last week. So, convener, I uh, wish to acknowledge the substantial contribution of Scottish natural heritage as lead authors of the route map and to put on record my thanks to the many organisations who have been involved in its preparation, in particular those represented on the delivery and monitoring group which reports to the Scottish Biodiversity Committee which I chair. Now, biodiversity, as we all know, is a key component to our lives. It underpins our health and well-being and contributes significantly to our prosperity. This was set out in the 2020 Challenge for Biodiversity, but also in the Scottish Government's latest economic strategy, which highlighted that protecting and enhancing our stock of natural capital is funda fundamental to a healthy and resilient economy and supports sectors such as agriculture, forestry, fisheries, tourism and renewables. So, convener, I'm delighted to be appearing before the committee this morning and I look forward to answering your questions. Thank you very much, Minister. Um, let me start by saying, you know, it's important for us to get a fix uh, on where the route map hopes to take us by 2020. I don't know if you've got any concise vision about what the biodiversity of Scotland should look like in 2020. Oh, I think certainly by 2020, I, think I would you know, really want us to be in a place where you know, the importance of biodiversity uh, is widely appreciated, you know, both for its own sake and because it underpins 
um, our economy uh, and our well-being. And you know, I would agree that I think we do need to focus on delivery, um, and that's why the biodiversity uh, route map has a strong emphasis on the practical work that is delivering uh, benefits you know, on the ground. And obviously, we have the governance arrangements as well, which um, support all of this work. And they are equally uh, as important, including, obviously, the role of the delivery and the monitoring group that we need to drive forward our delivery and to report to the Scottish Biodiversity Committee, which I chair. I'm glad that you mentioned uh, you know, delivery rather than process. Um, I'm sure that members will uh, question the detail in the route map as we go through this. Um, the question is, at the moment, um, is that likely to inspire people as a vision? Uh, because it's highly detailed and uh, you're de dealing with a very diverse audience. Because it strikes me that the kind of people who are already active in biodiversity are not just large organisations, but a whole welter of people across civil society and government at all levels. So is it going to inspire people as a vision uh, that uh, can allow them to be able to feel, yes, we've got something we can achieve, and yes, by 2020, we'll have achieved it? Um, well, I think it, I think it will, um, Convener. Obviously, we've got the, you know, both the biodiversity strategy as well as the route map, and I don't think you know, we can't see you know, either of those in isolation. You know, the fact that with our um, 2020 challenge itself, you know, the fact that that's adopted an ecosystems approach which focuses on our need to protect our ecosystems in order to support our nature, well-being and a thriving economy. And when it comes to, you know, the route map itself, I mean, you know, I think that draws together, you know, an a excellent picture of the contribution that a set of big steps and priority um, projects that have been taken forward on a partnership um, collaborative basis and what they will actually do towards you know, meeting the 2020 um, targets. And, and although the, the route map is not intended, obviously, to revisit the 2020 challenge, I think the introduction in the route map does seek to capture you know, its sense of ambition and our commitment to work with partners to improve the state, the state of nature in Scotland. Thank you. Mike Russell wants to pursue this. Yes, just building on that point, convener, I, I, I think perhaps there is an issue that you raise in terms of the detail of this plan. I think it is extraordinarily detailed. I think it is, uh, there's a lot of stuff that builds on a great deal of work that's gone before. But that may be a problem as well as, uh, as an advantage, which is, you know, there are many, many trees in this wood, but seeing the way through the wood particularly for what you might call a Twitter generation, who are people who have a limited attention span, who want to find one thing to do that is going to make a difference. It's not in there. You would have to spend an enormous amount of time uh, looking at the detail and know rather a lot about it. So I don't think that devalues the plan. What it does is ask where this plan fits into a wider strategy of the simple message that biodiversity is extremely important for the future, not just of, of Scotland, but of the planet, and how people can do things themselves to secure biodiversity, not just vote for the right people or, or, or support the right policies or uh, volunteer for, 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 for a variety of environmental agencies. How can you emphasize that with those people who will never read this plan and will never see it? And I think the key to that uh, question, um, Convener, is obviously I mean, the fact that what the route map does do is to set out very clearly you know, sort of the six big steps for nature, and it's very clear about the sort of 12 kind of priority um, collaborative projects, you know, that we are taking forward. I think there's a lot of good work mm -hmm. that's there around our sort of our peatland restoration, what we're doing around the conservation um, of species. I mean, we've made clear that this is um, an initial document, that more versions will follow, in which we're going to be providing more detail on the pressures on biodiversity what further action is needed to address these, notably in relation to the land use change and pollution and further refinement of the indicators um, being developed so that we can be more precise about actually what is changing and why and more detail on who is actually leading the work specified with this shared across our agencies and you know, our NGOs and our estates because the route map is you know, primarily for our agencies and our NGOs and you know, sort of working collaboratively with their partners in delivering it. What about for those people who want less detail rather than more detail, who just want to, to, be, to be told 
one thing or inspired to do something. Where does that fit into this plan? Um, Mr. Russell, that's a really good question. Um, and if we um, had distilled this into to one thing, I think we would have been criticised for omitting so many other uh, aspects. And just as an aside, um, one of our uh, NGO uh, partners um, uh, commented that this was perhaps an overly thorough um, uh, document. So how, how do we take that um, sort of uh, damning with faint praise? Um, it is intentionally thorough. Um, it's structured in a way that we think is uh, understandable by those that we work with, um, but we don't really make any apology for the fact that it is quite detailed and thorough. Um, uh, and I'm not going to attempt to identify the single word that would inspire people. I'm not going to ask anybody to apologise for it. I think it's a very good document. I, you know, I, I'm slightly resistant to document that have different colours or three or four different colours in every page. But that being the case, I just, I'm just raising the question, and you know, I understand you're concerned about it, but I think it needs to be part of the strategy. And I think the committee would want to know the strategy is, includes that type of direct, simple approach, a greener Scotland approach to biodiversity that draws people in to do things um, the agencies are paid to do them. They're full of enthusiasts. It is that simple point that I'm looking for. Do you to respond? Um, there is, um, within the, the structures that, that the ministers refer to, there is a communications group that's looking at that sort of question about how best to communicate simple messages. Um, and one of the examples that they're looking at is, for example, drawing the relevance of um, a healthy environment um, to people's well-being right. to the health agenda and often in that sort of area there are simple messages that do resonate with people. Boyack with a question on the route map. Um, there's been one or two criticisms from different stakeholders about um, to what extent um, it, it has a strategic vision. Um, just picking up on the point that Mike Russell just made there. Um, and to what extent people will actually buy into um, what's in the route map, um, people not seeing themselves as being people who will implement the route map. We got representations about land managers in particular that they didn't see the relevance um, spelt out for their day-to-day -day work. Um, we also had the criticism that um, the route map doesn't really add value to what's already being done that in some senses it lists what's being done but it doesn't really add anything new so can you pick up those criticisms about the route map not necessarily leading to any actual new action which was one of the key things I think came out in last week's evidence about we're failing our target so everything needs to be stepped up and um, what I will say is that the actual um, the vision itself uh, is set out in the the actual strategy and the 2020 challenge for Scotland's biodiversity and in terms of you know, the route map, the route map is um, primarily kind of setting out the detail of how we actually deliver that vision <coughs> and what's, you know, what is deliverable um, on the ground, which is still ambitious. And I think, you know, I know there's been some concerns about the route map, um, whether it shows a lack of strategic thinking. We obviously don't accept this because, you know, it's a 2020 challenge that sets out the strategic challenge and this has been widely praised and the route map sets out obviously some of the work underway or plan to meet the 2020 challenge and, for example, in terms of the wildlife estates in um, Scotland, that is also uh, in the route map and it does sort of add value and also show where there is hard evidence as well. I suppose the issue is I'm quoting back to you the comments that we've received about the route map from those uh, key stakeholders and one of the clear comments from land and estates was that they didn't feel that land managers appeared to be at the very heart of the route map or the strategy and that there wasn't a reference to using policy tools and developing initiatives that will influence land managers um, but that's not the same thing as putting land managers at the heart of the strategy so there's there's that comment from land managers and I suppose the other thing that came out last week is um, impact on farming to what extent are farmers going to be um, obliged or feel willing to actually implement what's in the route map. It's that connection between aspiration and actual delivery on the ground. Um, our land managers are, I think, along with, along with others, they are at the heart of this um, document and they will be um, delivering eight of the priority projects uh, in the route map along with some of the, the health ones as well. And I want to pick up 
Yes, I mean, if I might, might add to that, um, I mean, in the route map, throughout the route map, there's a whole welter of activities that are either ongoing or planned. And under priority project 11, uh, which concerns sustainable land management, <coughs> there's considerable am ambition there and joint working with the farming uh, and land management community. The minister's just mentioned wildlife estates. Uh, for instance, and you know that that is a very ambitious project uh, to try and improve and widen uh, the benefits of certain forms of of land management. So is it just too early in the process then? Because people are clearly not seeing themselves at the heart of this document, even though that's your attention. How will this turn around? I mean, there is, as I say, you know, a number of things that we are doing around on sustainable land management. I mean. I see we, we talk about the ecological focus areas, for example, and the cap greening requirement and increased protection for our hedgerows and our watercourses, and obviously with the Wildlife Estates Scotland initiative, which is all about encouraging our best practice. We also have our, our demonstration um, farms, including our leaf farms and our climate change focus farms. So there is obviously there is, you know, a lot of detail in the route map in terms of the ongoing work, and they do set out very, you know, quite clearly you know, what the, uh, the planned work is kind of going forward. So we have a lot of work around our, have given support for our land scale, scale agri environment management under the new SRDP Environmental Cooperation Action Fund, for example, or promoting our agri environment and sustainable farming practices through the SRDP Farm Advisory Service in the Scottish Rural Network. And the other point was about new projects, a criticism that a lot of this is existing projects that are ongoing. And given the gap in meeting our existing targets, that we really need to lift up and have new projects that will um, make the real difference. You want to take that? Yes. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, if, if, if I may, I mean, again, there, I think um, there's considerable ambition in terms of new projects. You've only to look under habitats and species. Uh, some of the species mentioned there, curlew, corn bunting, some of the bee species. Um, to look at some of the raptors, hen harriers, golden eagles, project that we've got for uh, reinforcing the golden eagle population in the south of Scotland. We only have two to four nesting pairs at the moment. Uh, we could potentially have 14 to 16 pairs. We've got terrific partnership in place involving RSPB, Scottish Land and Estates, Game and Wildlife Conservation Trust, SNH and other bodies willing the reinforcement of that population. I mean, that to me seems to be very ambitious with a lot of work going on behind the scenes to ensure that habitat and other conditions are in place. And there are many other examples such, of, such as these. And perhaps it comes back to a point that Mr. Russell uh, was making earlier on, and just in terms of communicating this ambition. We've put a lot of effort into producing this, this route map and the many projects that are outlined here and perhaps once it's published, the time then, as the minister outlined, to develop the communication plan for this. I certainly would. Um, just, I want just to come back just on the, the point that Sarah Boyack made around with the wildlife estates. I mean, I think we would certainly be keen to, you know, encourage um, our partners who want to be involved. And, you know, obviously, you know, Scottish Land and Estates um, sit uh, on the Biodiversity Committee. And I know that they are, I think, bringing forward their annual report around the wildlife estates um, Scotland, so we're very much looking forward to, to seeing that and the kind of work that they've been involved in. Okay, um, we've got two supplementaries, Alec Ferguson and then Claudia Beamish. Uh, thank you, Convener. I, just, I, I think this part of the discussion is incredibly important because I think if the aims of the strategy and the plan and the route map, or whatever you want to call it, are to be achieved, I think this needs buy-in not just from the various agencies and partners involved, it needs buy-in from the people of Scotland, you know, the, the, the man in the street, frankly. Um, and uh, I last week um, I highlighted an email I'd had from an individual who'd been one day to um, an environmental conference, the next day to a, a farming seminar. And the words he used, he described it as being in two separate, two parallel universes in terms of the language that was being used. And I'm glad that, that um, Professor Thompson just mentioned communication, because I think communication is terribly important in all of this. And I think, if I may say so, I think we've become too sort of highfalutin about all of this. The phraseology that's used, the terminology that's used, is incredibly complex and complicated. I mean, when we were discussing this in 2013, I, I said, can we stop talking about biodiversity and start talking about the balance of nature? People understand the balance of nature. They don't necessarily understand 
a strategic plan through a route map for biodiversity 2020. And I just wonder if you would acknowledge that in communicating this properly, because it must be properly communicated if it's to be successful, there is a need to simplify the language to make it understandable, so that, to go back to where Mike Russell started, somebody, uh, a layman, can approach this plan and say, oh, that's a good idea, I can do something about that. Yes, I'd be very happy to do so. Um, I'm all for um, simplification of language and trying to kind of keep things as, you know, as simple as we can. I mean, I had um, the opportunity, uh, I think, last weekend to go along to the, the environment fair that had been organised by Tafis and Galloway Council, you know, and actually seeing um, the number of, you know, environmental, you know, partners and NGOs who were all there, but the number of, you know, the, the number of children who were there and who were engaging, you know, with, you know, environmental projects, and I think trying to keep this language as simple as we can around, you know, what this means for our, you know, our nature and our environment, um, I would absolutely agree with. Claudia Beamish. You know, good, good morning, Minister. Um, could I <coughs> ask you, in relation to following on from Sarah Boyack's uh, remarks about the evidence session last week and some of the written evidence we've had about... Uh, uh, new projects that fit into the, the biodiversity route map going forward. Um, and some concern has been expressed, as already has been highlighted this morning, about um, perhaps a lack of new uh, projects. And I wonder if you could comment specifically on, on um, three. Um, one is uh, what, the degree to which the National Ecological Network is going to be taken forward, um, building on the Central Scotland Green Network. Um, and another is something that's already been mentioned by uh, Des Thompson this morning in relation to curlews, because in their written evidence, um, uh, RSPB had stressed that there was a concern and it was being looked at internationally and that 55% of um, the curlew population has declined in Scotland um, <clears throat> over recent years, um, since 1995. So that, th those are two examples, one quite a broad example and one, a very specific one, about areas that I, I'm really questioning, where are we seeing new things coming into the route map? And I do have a question about <coughs> marine issues, but perhaps I could come back to that in a minute. Okay, do you want to take the... <coughs> Just that Curlew no. is a very good example, because we've yeah. named it in the route map. We're very yeah. fortunate, because our SPB uh, Scotland has been leading actually a European effort to restore curlew populations. We know we've got globally important populations, massive decline, considerable research being led by RSPB to try and identify the, the causes for the decline in curlews and therefore the work that's needed. And that's just the sort of work that's been captured within the route map. And as further versions of the route map are published, we would be setting out in greater detail the sort of work being undertaken. Right. Um, in terms of the other project that you were referring to, um, Claudia Beamish, around the, the um, Central Scotland Green Network, which um, I recently had the opportunity to go and um, visit uh, across in shots, but um, there is in the actual route map under the, the planned, um, planned work, there is, um, we do see that we will be developing a national ecological uh, network to enable mm -hmm. characterisation of the nature of Scotland and to help with the identification of priority areas for action around habitat restoration, creation and protection. Right, okay, that, thank you very much, Minister, that's encouraging. <coughs> and could I turn our minds to um, marine biodiversity, um, which, as you know, is um, Big Step 6, and uh, just the concern that's been expressed by some stakeholders about uh, the marine protected areas uh, not enhancing and only parts of marine protected areas actually um, being designated as, as no-take areas, uh, for instance, to give you an example. But also the broader issue that RSPB have raised, which is um, the concern that there aren't any or aren't very many new projects in relation to marine biodiversity. Well, what we will be doing with on biodiversity for on marine areas is developing the evidence base through the setting and delivering of surveillance and a monitoring strategy that will allow authoritative reporting of the state um, and the progress. And we'll also we'll be completing the suite of marine protected uh, areas, including the additional natura sites, and agreeing and delivering uh, measures for their effective management, as well as putting in place, obviously, the, re the regional 
marine plans that incorporate the provision for decision-making that will promote uh, ecological coherence between the protected areas and the safeguards for the priority marine features? Right, thank you. Thank you. Um, we'll move on to the idea of mainstreaming uh, and biodiversity duty reporting. Angus MacDonald first. Yes, thanks, Convener. Um, good, good morning, uh, Minister. Um, just touching on, on Claudia Bemish's point uh, regarding uh, new projects, um, I'm pleased to say that I have a copy of Falkirk Council's uh, uh, biodiversity duty report here, um, covering the period 2011 to, to 2014. Uh, and it highlights some excellent work to date. Uh, however, it also highlights uh, projects that are underway, including the Inner Force Landscape Initiative, which combines about 30 projects, 30 plus projects, uh, between now and 2019. Uh, so there's certainly a high number of uh, new projects going ahead in, in, in my area. Um, now, uh, SPICE, Spice confirmed uh, through the uh, Scottish Government that they've received 25 biodiversity duty reports from local authorities and 11 from uh, other public bodies. However, um, it does appear that some local authorities and the vast majority of public bodies haven't informed the Scottish Government that they've published a biodiversity duty report. So are, are you aware, Minister, um, if all the organisations and public uh, bodies that should have produced uh, biodiversity duty reports have done so? Um, to date, uh, the Scottish Government have been informed of the publication of 34 reports. Obviously, as a government, we encourage our public bodies to inform it of the publication of reports on the biodiversity uh, duty, but this uh, is not a requirement. So the list that we have on the Biodiversity Scotland uh, webpage may not be uh, comprehensive, uh, there are no sanctions in the Wildlife and Natural Environment um, Scotland Act against those public bodies who fail to uh, report. But we will, uh, however, uh, we will be revising uh, the guidance to public bodies to make reporting uh, easier for the next round, and we will shortly be commissioning uh, a research project to evaluate the compliance and the quality of the biodiversity duty reports. And that research project um, will begin... Uh, later in uh, this year. Okay, thanks. Will you be looking at sanctions as an option in the future? Well, I think we certainly want to um, review the guidance and um, then we'll see where we get to after that. But I'm certainly very keen to make sure that we're getting our public bodies um, reporting to us on their biodiversity. Okay, and the reports that you have received um, to date, uh, what use will be made of these? Um, well, we certainly will be using our... Um, the reports that we receive, you know, obviously just to kind of, you know, get, get a sense of what's happening and what's going on, you know, through, you know, our different agencies and our local authorities. Um, and then, you know, then we'll see from there. You want to pick up on? Uh, well, just uh, in, in terms of moving the route map further forward, there's actually a lot of very important uh, regional and local activities, projects being carried out that we'd certainly like to reflect in future versions of the route map. And one of the things we did also do is we have um, written to all our public bodies to remind them uh, of their obligation to report on the biodiversity um, duty, and we have provided um, detailed um, guidance. But I don't think that the, the actual duty itself is specifically mentioned in the, the grant and aid um, letters because it hasn't been the Scottish Government's practice to seek to list all the statutory um, duties which apply to public bodies, but I'm very happy um, to look at this again. That's good, thanks. Any further points on that? OK. Yes, Sarah Boyer. Um, have you any sense of why different organisations aren't putting together um, reports? Is it lack of expertise? Is it lack of priority? Um, is it that they don't see it as relevant to the organisation? Um, I mean, I think last week it was reported that we'd got 25 local authorities have produced biodiversity action plans. We've got 32 local authorities. So do we have a sense of why others aren't all doing it as well. Yeah, well, it's, it, it's partly resourcing. I mean, just in terms of the time and effort that's being devoted to this, all I can say is that the ones we've seen have been excellent, actually. We've got to just try and sh share that experience. 
Okay, Claudia Bimish. Uh, thank you, Davina. Uh, could I just come back on that point? And um, I recall in, in years past that uh, some local authorities have had a, a dedicated biodiversity officer, and I wonder if there's any um, information on how many local authorities now have that, uh, or, or at least someone who's you know part of their mm. remit is that because it would seem that if there isn't somebody specifically focusing on it, that might answer some of the question as to why um, seven of the local authorities may indeed have reported but haven't informed yeah. Scottish Government they've reported. Mm. Well, cer certainly where we have local biodiversity officers, it makes a, a huge difference yeah. in terms of marshalling all the activities mm. and all the projects that have been carried out. And there are some exceptional individuals out there um, doing fantastic things for nature. I think you make a good point, yeah. Maybe you could quite write to us to, on that point. Yeah. yeah, we're quite happy to come back to the committee on that. <coughs> Thank you. Thank you. Um, Non-native invasive species. Right. Right, um, the um, evidence that the committee heard last week uh, indicated that some organisations remain very committed to the eradication of uh, non-native invasive species and believe it should be a priority in their biodiversity plans. Others are less convinced that that is now a priority. Um, and I think uh, the evidence we had, for example, in Sumars in, in SNH, was that there's no point in one individual doing this with enthusiasm if their next-door neighbour is not doing it at all, by definition. So I'd just be interested to know what priority the government now gives to this, whether they rec the government recognises that, worthy and important as this may well be in certain circumstances, there are some circumstances where it is not possible any longer to fight this fight, and how you make those decisions. Um, certainly the spread of these um, invasive um, non-native species and wildlife diseases are certainly one of the key pressures you know, on biodiversity and our water environments in our islands are particularly vulnerable to our uh, invasive non-native species while obviously our woodlands are also threatened by our various tree diseases. So these invasive species are now the single biggest negative uh, pressure on protected um, nature sites and it's clearly important, certainly for me it's clearly important that you know action against our non-native species is carefully assessed and prioritised at a national level to ensure that expensive um, commitments deliver value for money and that they can be sustained. I mean I think one of the most important uh, jobs at a national level is obviously to prevent um, new species becoming um, established by identifying and addressing uh, pathways and ensuring that we have good biosecurity uh, measures in place. For example, you know, new legislation will um, be coming forward to ban um, the sale or the keeping of highly invasive aquatic plants um, commonly used in aquaria. But this is the job of the non-native uh, species action group. I mean, we have projects themselves such as the used um, WEDA project, which seeks to remove non-native um, hedgehogs from the um, from the use to protect nesting seabirds, or we have obviously Saving Scotland's uh, Red Squirrels project are carried out at a landscape level, and you know they need to be um, carefully uh, coordinated and monitored um, to avoid uh, any fragmentation and any wasted or duplicated uh, effort. I mean, at a obviously at a local level, we do seek to encourage partnerships between our landowners, uh, SNH, SEPA, our NGOs, uh, and our volunteers. I think you give some very interesting examples. I mean, I am old enough to remember the individual who brought the first hedgehog to Europe, so I shall not name him here now. I think Des knows who I'm talking about. And that was with the best of intentions, but with the worst of results. But a distinction, I think, needs to be made between that type of action, which can be prevented, mm -hmm. and, for example, the, the spread of remora, where it is, there is a disease that is, is spreading, and as far as we are aware... There is as yet no effective means of treating that disease apart from very radical action uh, within forests. What priority, relative priority do you give to prevention, um, eradication, disease control? And given that it will absorb more and more of the resource that, that, that exists in the state, is it really a sustainable activity? Or are you going to have to prioritise this in a different way? Um, I think in terms of... Um I mean, prevention, I mean, we've got wide-ranging legislation um, which takes a general um, no-release approach to the introduction of non-native species. Um, I mean, where exceptions are needed, they are provided through secondary legislation or under uh, licence from uh, SNH. 
In terms of early detection uh, and rapid eradication, I mean, our top priorities are to identify how these species invade and act quickly to prevent their establishment and spread. I mean, early detection uh, and reporting is encouraged through our monitoring programmes and citizen science initiatives, such as the Plant Tracker app. And part of the uh, agencies um, for the invasive non-native species responsibilities is to assess risks as they arise and to develop um, appropriate um, responses. I mean, recent successes have included action to prevent the establishment of the, the zebra mussel, uh, raccoon, uh, marbled crayfish and black-tailed prairie dog. Is it, uh, finally, convener, if I might, is it, there must become a moment, I mean, rhododendron is a classic example, yeah, that's there it. must become a moment in which something is no longer an invasive, invasive non-native species, but has in actual fact become part of the landscape which requires eradication or careful control in the sense that, um, you know, a, a bracken, for example, you know, is, is, is rampant within parts of Scotland and requires control. Uh, how do you treat that? Because that becomes a land management problem more than a, a simple biodiversity problem. And the resources that are applied for, in land management terms to the Commission and others become important. Well, yes, I mean, the, the, the case is very made extremely well, thinking about bracken and rhododendron, but surely that reinforces the huge effort we're putting into preventing mm -hmm. invasion in the first place. And I have to say, just as the Minister was highlighting there, there are some exemplary examples, whether it's, um, you know, American mink, hedgehogs, rhododendron control, riverbank vegetation, in, in Britain, indeed in Europe, we are leading the way in terms of tackling uh, non-native invasives. And the key message, as the Minister has been, just been reinforcing, is prevention. Getting that message across about the huge risks, not only to nature, but in terms of the sort of economic cost of, of, you know, of ensuring that this is done. Okay. Ferguson, then Jim Hume. Um, I just want I, three words I want to put in front of you, Minister, and I suspect you can put money on what they are. American signal crayfish. Mm. Because I, I listened very carefully to your reply, and I can't argue with any of it, but everything you've said is just about blown apart by the situation with the American signal, American signal crayfish in Loch Ken in my constituency. And, um, you know, frankly, the me measures that have been taken there to try to um, stop them spreading have not worked. They are spreading. They may have spread faster if these measures hadn't been taken. I don't know. But there comes, I simply put it to you that, as I think Mike Russell said, there will come a time when these can no longer be looked upon as invasive. They will be part of our mm. everyday scenery. And, and somewhere along the line in all of this, with something like rhododendron, with something like American signal crayfish, you have to accept that unless you're going to press the nuclear button and really do something serious about them, that they're here and they're here to stay. And when that becomes the case, a different approach, I think, has to be taken. And I, I just put that to you as a, as a general thought. Just in response, um, convener, um, I mean, I, as Mr. Ferguson well knows, I mean, I, you know, recognise the, um, the local concerns and, you know, the fact that this has been a long-standing um, serious issue with our uh, North American signal crayfish at Loch Ken, so, and I'm very keen to try and find a way um, to try and resolve this. So I would uh, be very happy to have a meeting uh, with Mr. Ferguson around, you know, the crayfish in Loch Ken to see what else we can be, you know, can explore. Because I'm conscious that, you know, my uh, predecessor Paul Wheelhouse um, did um, hold a meeting in New Galloway. Um, last July, um, to which a number of interested parties were in, obviously were, were invited. There is no easy solution, but I say I'm very happy to um, to meet with Mr. Ferguson to try and to try and fathom a way through this with our American signal crayfish in Loch Ain. I'll take the minister up on that invitation. Thank you. Is there no natural predator for the, the signal crayfish? No. Man. Well, in that case, we look forward to what the conversation produces. <laughs> uh, Jim Hume. Very much, Convener. Um, just mentioned about woodla woodlands being threatened. Just mentioned about woodlands being threatened and uh, imported diseases. Of course, one that I think of is ash dieback, cholera. Um, and it's mentioned, you know, control's fine, but prevention, as I said, is far more important. I just wonder what work the government's been doing uh, regarding 
uh, importing specific uh, arboreal diseases. And um, I wonder if any thoughts have been meant to, uh, put into uh, looking at encouraging more local nurseries rather than what we've been seeing at the moment where nurseries are, are getting larger and centralised and, and obviously leading to diseases such as uh, ash dieback spreading faster uh, across large areas, not just of, of course, UK, Scotland, but also Europe. I mean, uh, if, if I could just sort of comment on that, we're in extremely fortunate in Scotland because in terms of the research, there's a huge amount of work being done by forest research. Um, we've got Plant Health Centre of Expertise doing work. Um, we're now having to look at a whole range of ways of trying to make the trees and the woodland ecosystems more resistant. You mentioned the use of nurseries. That's clearly very important in terms of, in terms of developing uh, resistant strains. I think this is one area where we're very fortunate to have a very strong research base in place. We've responded to the pressures. Indeed, some of the pressures have been anticipated some time ago. And therefore, we're well ahead of the game in terms of trying to find solutions to this. It's, it, it's a very challenging problem, as you've set out. And one of you just to add to that, um, convener, is um, we are developing a Scottish plant health um, strategy. Um, I think it was, you know, we, we do recognise um, the number of um, plant health threats that are rising and the spread of um, pests that has, you know, increased um, due to the, you know, globalisation of, of trade and um, climate change. But that um, plant health strategy, it will set out measures to safeguard Scottish agriculture, horticulture, forestry and the wider environment from pests and disease. And it will be consistent, obviously, with the ambitions, you know, of the UK plant um, biosecurity strategy. And also, we've seen us, we see an appointment of the UK Chief Plant Health Officer. The Scottish Government have also committed to the appointment of a Scottish Chief Plant Health Officer, and that will complement um, the UK Chief Health Plant Health Officer as well. Thanks very much. Right, thank you. Thank you. Um, we're moving on to a natural capital agenda, and, uh, the Natural Capital Asset Index. So, Jim Hume again. Yes, uh, th thanks very much. Uh, again, convener, big step number two is in investment in, in natural capital. And two years ago, this committee encouraged uh, in a letter to the then minister um, to uh, give more sort of detail as to uh, uh, how that can uh, be translated to action on the ground. Scottish land and estates, uh, they state that the natural capital agenda has, has good promise, but isn't quite tangible yet. Uh, they did note that Woodland Carbon Code is, is, is something that is moving in the right direction, but probably still needs to be a bit more tangible. So just wonder what the Minister thinks we can do to uh, make the National Cap uh, Natural Capital Asset Index more tangible on the ground so that actual land managers can buy into the biodiversity agenda uh, in a more meaningful way. Well, I think um, a number of steps are you know, already being um, taken to make the concept of natural capital relevant to biodiversity and also to the wider Scottish Government strategy and policy. And I think, you know, obviously I would draw the committee's attention back to the, to the 2020 challenge on biodiversity, which includes, I think, chapter two on natural capital. And, you know, this captures not only the role that um, natural capital plays in underpinning our economy and well-being, but it does set out some very practical uh, on-the-ground examples of nature services and, you know, their value. You know, the work by the Scottish Government and a number of partners on, like, peatland restoration is a very practical uh, on-the-ground uh, example. We're also supporting those who are developing the concept of natural capital. And, you know, I'm delighted that the Scottish Government is helping to fund the work of the Scottish Forum uh, on natural capital. And I think two of our senior staff, including the chief economists, sit on the forum's... Um, steering group and obviously we also supported the inaugural uh, World Forum on Natural Capital that was held in Edinburgh in 2013. As Jim Hume will probably be aware, natural capital was also referred to in the latest Scottish Government uh, economic strategy which we published um, recently and obviously this was also being welcomed by Johnny Hughes who is obviously the co-chair of the Scottish Forum on Natural Capital. Okay, no, thanks. Fine for me. Um, Anyone else want to come in on that? Just now, well, I'd just like to ask, when we talk about land managers, 
We're thinking about uh, hill farmers. We're thinking about crofters just as much as um, you know, estate managers. Um, how is the question of natural capital being addressed with regard to uh, these small land managers? Well, I, th I think actually um, the land managers, um, thinking of crofters and of course thinking of your own constituency convener, they probably get natural capital more readily than many other people are thinking about it. If you think of the, the sort of vast peatland ecosystem that you're familiar with, they've been treating peatlands as natural capital for, for centuries. So they have no difficulty thinking about the value of peat in terms of a carbon store, what it does for clean water, uh, what it does for wildlife, what it does in terms of reinforcing the cultural identity of the area. And that's all part of the, the, the natural capital of the area. So I think something that's reassuring here is that many of these organisations say, yes, we understand natural capital, and indeed we, we've been ahead of the, the boffins and others who are articulating it. Unless we have the economic support for people uh, in those areas, they're not going to be able to apply natural capital. And it is very worrying uh, when I see uh, the RSPB submission to this, which suggests that somehow or other we're only spending 27% of the SRDP on uh, agri-environment measures, whereas in England it's over 60%. But this doesn't take into account the less favoured areas where we have to support the very people who you've just said are more alert to biodiversity. And uh, I just find this comparison of apples with pears that the RSPB has done is to be completely unhelpful when we're actually looking at the way in which we can apply the monies that we have. Yes. I, th I think part of the challenge there, of course, is converting the sort of habitat condition that's being improved for these measures into a, into a measure of, of natural capital. And perhaps some organisations have been better at doing that than others. You think of some of the RSPB land holdings, Inch Marshes, for instance, some of the areas in the flow country, the natural capital of these areas is very considerable and, and benefits considerably um, from um, the various grants and other support that's provided. I don't deny that, that uh, they obviously have got good examples, but when I started off asking about crofters and hill farmers, they clearly are the very key people who are supported by Elfas, yes. which the RSPB doesn't like. But I think in terms of convener, when you were uh, mentioned about the agri environment um, climate, I mean obviously we did, you know, the cabinet secretary um, did uh, ensure that there was an increase uh, in that budget to over ten million pounds um, per year. So let's uh, move on then to question seven, which uh, looks at data and things like that, which Claudia Beamish is going to. Read Thank on. you, convener. Um, Last week, Minister, as you'll know, there was quite a broad-ranging discussion on monitoring research and biodiversity indicators. And just to highlight one or two um, remarks that were made last week in evidence, um, James Davidson of the um, Aberdeenshire Council said that based on the experience of land use strategy pilot project he was involved with, more local data and uh, indicators were needed, and it would allow more effective targeting of resources. Um, whereas uh, Simon Jones from SWT said that we shouldn't let the lack of data stop us from doing work on the ground at the moment. And as, as you'll know, Minister, the State of Nature Scotland report, which was launched, um, I think, last year um, uh, in, in, in Edinburgh, um, it actually states, and I quote, we simply do not have sufficient knowledge to make a robust quantitative assessment of the state of nature in Scotland. So there's the, this sort of conflict between, um, in some areas, a lack of evidence and, and yet the need to, to act. And so um, we're wondering as a committee how the monitoring of biodiversity and providing of data and research to support action on the ground can be moved forward so that local data is available for resources to be targeted at smaller scale projects? I think um, I mean, the, main, the main priority at the minute uh, is around our ecosystem health indicators and it is intended that the set of indicators will be presented nationally but will be scalable to a finer resolution and this will help us to 
try and understand the status of Scotland's uh, ecosystems over time and to make priorities for um, restoration to inform um, the action that's been taken and also so we can assess the progress that's being made. And I think much of that work has been taken forward by a subgroup um, of the science and uh, the science and technical um, group where we've got membership that has been drawn from our James Hutton Institute, from Marine Scotland, our rural college, the RSPB, the Centre for Ecology uh, and Hydrology. And, you know, because what we're needing to do is to try to continue to deepen, you know, our understanding and our evidence base. And, you know, we need we need to do both because, you know, one supports, you know, one supports the other and we need to be, you know, clearer, you know, what needs to be done to improve, you know, our ecosystem's health. Right. Thank you, Minister. And, and through the convener, will, will that be, a, what will the process be whereby um, the people at local level working um, with NGOs and local authorities and, and for instance, if we use the um, North American signal crayfish as an example, you know, or invasive species, which we took evidence from the previous minister on, on ash dieback uh, last year. How, how will those issues and the continuing research be fed into uh, those people that matter on the ground? I mean, it will be set out in the annual report, but, yeah. you know, if you want to add it to Well, y yes, as, as we've set out, as quite rightly indicated, Minister, the tail end of the route map, we've indicated that we're producing an annual State of Nature report, drawing on the many indicators that we have. And bear in mind, these indicators have contributions from thousands of people working across Scotland and a whole range of taxonomic groups. And I, I, I do think we need to turn this around, actually. You know, we have a phenomenal uh, resource of people uh, you know, called citizen scientists out there collecting an amazing amount of data. And we're very fortunate to be able to capture that and report on what's happening and understanding the underlying causes of change. That process, but taking it further is the question I'm asking really about how that process will then be fed back to those who are responsible for citizen science, for local um, authority biodiversity, mm -hmm. for working in NGOs, you know. That, that, that has obviously got to be robust if we're going to meet our 2020 targets. It does, and as you highlighted earlier on, one of the great ways of doing this is through the local biodiversity officers mm -hmm. who are supremely well equipped at doing this and trying to redirect the efforts of people working on the ground locally. Right. And, and could I just finally ask in, in relation to the monitoring and, <coughs> and assessment and indicators how the biodiversity um, targets fit with the national performance framework and the targets in, in that, that um, obviously um, the Cabinet Secretary for Finance is very keen that it's taken forward and considered by committees. And for instance, terrestrial birds or other, other areas that relate to biodiversity. No, they contribute to the national performance directly. framework directly. Yeah. Um, change of subject, uh, the role of education. Um, Dave Thompson. Yeah, thank you very much, convener. Uh, morning, uh, Minister and uh, uh, colleagues. Um, yeah, la last week I picked up on a point on um, education, Minister, and uh, if you look at uh, Big Step 3 and Priority Project 6, taking learning outdoors, the aim is to increase secondary and primary schools' access to green space and nature for outdoor learning. <coughs> now, there's a very good example of an outdoor learning venture in my constituency in Lochaber, the Lochaber Rural Education Trust, run by Isabel and Linda uh, Campbell, who I met a number of years ago, and we've been trying to assist them to get funding to keep this fantastic little project on the road with great difficulty. Uh, the previous First Minister, when he was with the Cabinet in Lochaber, actually went along to have a, a look at it and, and thought it was fantastic, but there's no funding for them. Now, we've got, when you've got something like that that is working really well and it's school children that come out and they learn a lot of very useful things about uh, uh, outdoor, about the environment, about uh, animals, about growing things and so on, and we can't seem to find a regular source of funding to keep that unit going, which is run by uh, volunteers in the main, 
And there's problems with the schools who run out of funds for buses to take their children to the place as well. And in a constituency like mine, where you've got massive distances to travel, you know, you need to travel to these things because you can't have them in every single, single place. So what's actually being done... Um, what sort of cross-departmental work is being done to ensure that there are proper funding streams for really excellent uh, examples like this, which, if it doesn't get proper funding soon, there's been a few short-term funding uh, uh, um, proposals that they have had, but if they don't, the thing's going to close down. So... Where does that leave us, you know, if we're not actually, if we don't have a separate identifiable funding stream that folk like that can actually bid into? I'm going to bring in um, officials, but what I'll say to begin with um, to Dave Thompson is, um, you know, I agree with some of the, the fantastic projects that are out there for our schools. I mean, I had... Um, the opportunity a few weeks ago to meet with um, some of our local biodiversity um, action uh, plan officers, where you know I heard all about it was a northeast Scotland um, camera trap project, which was absolutely fantastic. You know, been set up to gather information on some of the more um, secretive um, mammal species living in our woodlands across the northeast. Um, and this project actually had gathered, to be, to be honest, Convener, this, this project actually captured me, um, you know, because there were thousands and thousands of images and videos that were, you know, revealed the movement of a range of species, um, including our, you know, our wood mouse, our red squirrel, our badgers, our otters, and pine martens. And, on, and that was all done with the help of local volunteers. And obviously this was through our, our schools in Aberdeen and Aberdeenshire and, and Murray. And that project had received funding um, from um, LEADER and the Forestry Commission Scotland you know, to try and help to work with a number of schools um, who were involved with this project. But I think at this point I will bring in officials who you want to... Uh, well, I just, I mean, I think two things there. One, just to, to add to that, and these, that sort of wonderful example you've given, of course, through the curriculums, um, there's a huge amount being done to improve uh, educational awareness. And also to mention Young Scott. We're doing a lot mm -hmm. of work with Young Scott at the moment to promote the sort of wider links between uh, education and appreciating and caring for nature. So actually, there are a lot of examples around the board. Maybe if I can just come back, uh, that's all great, that's mm. fantastic, and uh, it's good, good to hear that. But I think when uh, the former First Minister visited them four years ago or whatever, he mentioned leader, and nothing came of it. Uh, and they've struggled on ever since, and it's a great project. So, you know, OK, there are things like leader out there, but it doesn't seem to be working very effectively. Why have a Priority Project 6 to increase... The, the secondary and primary school access um, when you've already got people volunteering to run something who need a relatively small amount of regular income why can't we help them that's the point because you've got them they're on the ground they're doing it it's very valuable if you lose it, you're going backwards, you're not going forwards. And although there are things happening in the schools and all that, and there's maybe other things going on, why aren't we looking? I would invite the minister and yourselves to come up to the, see this little project. You know, I'd be more than happy, and I'm sure that um, th they would be really pleased to see you. Um, so you can assess for yourselves uh, the value of that kind of project. It's in a very rural area. It's just below Anachmoor, the, the ski slopes. So um, you could have a up in the gondolas when you come up as well, Minister, and that would be an interesting experience too. But we've got that this, this working, and it's in danger of folding because there's no um, proper identify... I mean, you should be identifying some kind of funding stream that is there, that these these projects can, can deal with it. And it's, it's about um, thinking across departments and so on, I think. I'd be more than happy to uh, accept the members' uh, invitation to come and see this project, but also just to say that um, I'd be more than happy for the member to uh, write to me as well about this particular case. 
um, as well, just kind of setting out all the all the details. I think that'd be very helpful for us, mm. and we'll look to see how we can take that forward. Thank you. Tour beyond our ken and all that. Um, I think it's certainly Thank valuable you. for the summer to see some of these things. I just wonder if we can add at this point that probably asking the education ministers about uh, the way in which the focus on eco schools um, uh, are looked at and reviewed might be something that could help more specifically with uh, biodiversity education and, uh, and so on. But uh, I was going to mention one or two other things uh, about that uh, and other things that we need to raise with you in a minute. Mike Russell on this point. I, I think it would be remiss not to it. mention two other developments which tie yeah. in and perhaps the problem is there are so many different developments in there that some uh, cohesion is required. One is Forest Schools and the Forestry Commission Initiative, which is extremely important, and I think some of the best <coughs> outdoor education. The other one is a growing development of outdoor nurseries, and indeed in Mr. Thompson's own constituency, uh, Stramash, an Argyle-based provider of, of outdoor education, is about to start its second or third, actually third, outdoor nursery where the children are uh, out of doors for almost the entire time and the only shelter on the site is uh, uh, a large yurt which uh, they, they, they eat in from time to time. So there are many initiatives. The question is how they are drawn together. Perhaps the minister would care to cooperate with her counterparts in education to see if the committee might be informed about drawing together that and seeing where the budget lines are and how they, how they tie together. Yeah, I think I'd be very happy to do that and also in relation to on the health as well because you know I know that there are a number of um, very good kind of green health projects that are mm. being sort of taken forward through the Forestry Commission Scotland and um, with our NHS. Uh, a, a, a briefing from the government about how these all tie together and, yeah, and what they are. Happy to provide I think that we would find committee. out quite a lot from it. Sarah Boyack in this point. Thanks, Convener. It's a follow-up to the education question, which is about um, access to skills, and um, it really follow on, follows on from Dave Thompson's question about making sure that um, biodiversity is embedded in the school curriculum in some way, but it's to further move on to young people thinking about taxonomy or um, work in biodiversity as being a potential career option. There's a whole load of careers out there, but it's to what extent does that follow through the school system? And it was one of the key issues asked last week about the lack of numbers of skilled taxonomists and the fact that we're not recruiting new people, but it, it would fit with a whole range of the different um, careers, environmental careers, land management careers, that having a, a positive approach to biodiversity would be a very useful building block for. Yes, well, uh, if, if I could just comment on that, and uh, I, I did note with interest what was said last week, that, I mean, the NGOs here have done a fantastic job, organisations like SWT, Plant Life, RSPB, in terms of nurturing um, that expertise and en encouraging specialisms in, in different taxonomic disciplines. I think for, for my own organisation, SNH, we're employing a number of graduates each year, uh, to develop their skins, skills, and that's terrific in terms of their employability. And we also fund a PhD scheme, so at the, the highest level in terms of developing skills. So I think, and, and SEPA is no different, it's actively involved in a number of PhD schemes. So this is something we're acutely aware of, but we should not lose sight <coughs> of the importance of reaching the youngest people. It's through the nurseries that we heard about, uh, early primary school stage. If we can reach the kids at that stage, we can have a lasting impact uh, on their appreciation of the environment uh, and how the environment is cared by them. And I would just um, echo those uh, comments, um, Convener, but just to also add that, you know, there is also been continued investment by the Scottish Government via our um, Rural Affairs Food and Environment um, research in the Royal Botanic Garden, uh, Edinburgh, which provides support to, you know, world-leading taxonic institution and the scientific bi uh, botanic garden. And I know that, um, that the Royal Botanic um, Garden in Edinburgh provides... Um, specialised programmes are also at PhD level, so you know, we're now delivering, I think, in partnership with the James Hutton Institute and the University of Aberdeen, like the first PhD in, in lichen um, taxonomy in the UK in more than 30 years. That's some very, very different answer to the issue that was raised last week with us. Uh -huh. Okay, Thank well, we'll reflect on that when we're yep. uh, thinking about our own next... Uh, 
moves in this direction. Um, before we move to the final point, uh, there was a question about Big Step 6, which Christian Allard wished to ask about marine and coastal ecosystems. Yes, thank you, Commander. I wanted to come back to uh, the uh, Big Step 6, and particularly on the marine ecosystem. Um, we heard a lot this morning about uh, how come uh, farmers and land managers and crofters need to be at the heart of the strategy. And uh, we heard as well how uh, managers and conservationists um, have got, there is a, a gulf between the, the land managers, the conservationists, and maybe the um, natural capital will be able to, to address this. I would like to know from the minister how uh, we, can, uh, we have the same gulf in the, in the marine environment between uh, the, uh, the people who harvest our seas and the, uh, the NGOs, and how the strategy will, uh, will address this particular gulf. So, just so that I'm clear, is, is the question about what we're doing in relation to coastal environment and coastal restoration? Yeah, and yeah. marine environment as well as the ecosystem in, in uh, uh, the status of our seas. I sure. think the, the, the fishermen and the people who harvest our seas well. have been uh, very proactive, and I don't want them to be uh, to have the same feeling that the land managers maybe and the farmers and the crofters mm -hmm. have not been involved so much in the strategy. And I didn't see a lot, a, a lot in it on the big step six. No, well, I, th I think certainly the minister set out earlier on under... Uh, pri priority project 12 in terms of what we're doing in relation to the seas, a sort of a considerable amount of, of evidence gathering uh, to try and sort of understand the sort of um, wealth of nature that we've got and the sort of work that we need to take to address that. Uh, indeed, uh, SNH has got uh, a specialist at the moment seconded to the Scottish Government to develop our understanding of coastal erosion and coastal processes so that we are, we are ensuring that these areas are much more robust to change. But, you know, the strategy is, is targeted not only to the NGOs, but it's targeted as well uh, for the benefits of, you know, the coastal communities, which is harvesting our Oh, uh, absolutely. Yes, of course. And there are a whole variety of coastal fora that we're working with in order to, to take this forward, you know, ranging from the Forth and Clyde coastal fora to, to other more regional ones. It's, and it's incredibly important we do that. These coastal fora are, are so in effective because they're operating across the marine uh, and, and land environment. Can you I was just going to um, just add that we are, you know, very happy to um, come back to the committee. Maybe just to kind of, I think, um, just to set out, you know, the approach that's kind of adopted um, by Marine Scotland. Because obviously, I'm very conscious that that's um, with and the portfolio of the Cabinet Secretary as well. Um, just around how they kind of work between with the environmental. Uh, groups and with the fishing sector as well, because obviously you're, you're talking about um, in relation to conflicts, so we'll be very happy to kind of set some of that out for the committee okay. if you find that helpful. Right, another wrap-up point from Dave Thompson, I think, just now, very briefly. Thank you very much, convener. Just a, a couple of quick points, and it's to do with um, your, you, the, your, your involvement, your department's involvement with, say, transport and infrastructure. And, you know, the, the, the A9 is um, uh, about to be uh, jewelled and, and, and all the preparatory work is being prepared. And there's two points that, that come up there. In uh, Priority Project 5, your planned work is delivering the national walking and cycling network and promoting its use by the public. And I've certainly been pressing very hard that there needs to be a proper not a cycleway uh, all the way up the A9. We're going to spend £3,000 million on this road, by the way, which I think you know. Um, we need to ensure there's a proper people way so that bikes can use it, walkers can use it, people in disability buggies can use it. To do with the biodiversity strategy? Well, it, it, it is. It's to do with the um, Priority Project 5, uh -huh. delivering the National Walking and Cycling Network. Right. So what I want to ascertain, convener, is yeah. the, 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 do um, the departments work together in relation to this? Have you had an input? Are we going to get a proper uh, cycleway, walkway alongside the A9 when we're actually improving it? And the second point is, and this is very much to do with uh, biodiversity, are we going to have green bridges? Because otherwise you create a barrier over which 
wildlife, etc., have great difficulty in moving, whereas green bridges give them a green way of getting from one side of the road to the other. Now, this is all going to add cost, but I think we need to be looking at these things uh, in a project of this size we need to get it right. And I just wonder how much involvement you've had as a department with this. And if, if you have, that's great. And, and, and if you haven't, I think you should. Well, it's something that we are, you know, we are considering already. And I think um, certainly we are delivering the, um, the National Walking and um, Cycling uh, Network and you know, promoting its use um, by the public. We're also looking at how we can improve the provision um, of green space in many of our disadvantaged areas of urban Scotland, but that's through a number of our green infrastructure um, projects that would be funded through the Scotland's um, 2040 to 2020 Structural Fund programme. So, as you know, these are, are all areas that we are currently considering mm. right now. It's all right. Um, just to say that we have been meeting at a central level um, with Transport Scotland colleagues in relation to um, the A9 and, and biodiversity, and uh, there has also been a lot of detailed work and discussion with um, Cairngorms National Park Authority, um, who, of course, is a significant part of the route runs through um, the, the park area. So there is work ongoing at, at, at detailed level, looking at individual sort of sites and opportunities in relation, certainly in relation to biodiversity and opportunities along the route. Yeah, well, uh, thank you very much for that. And uh, uh, I'd be interested, um, the, the, the first section uh, can Craig to Dalradi, uh, they're already consulting on the detail of it. I haven't had a chance to look at that in detail yet, but I will be. And I would certainly hope that, you know, a proper cycleway, walkway and green bridges are being considered. Yeah. Uh, Minister. Um, there's other things you need to update us on um, because Paul Wheelhouse gave us uh, you know, a lot of information in our session on the 18th of March 2013 and I wonder if you'd agree to write to us um, of updates about the National Ecological Network, a small part of which we've just been discussing, yeah. um, the strategic programme for re-establishing species driven to local and national extinction, uh, progress on work being undertaken to restore degraded ecosystems and progress on tackling marine biodiversity. Uh, these were all touched on by the previous minister and it would be very valuable to us in our considerations to get an update. Convener, I'm very happy to do so. Well, thank you very much, Minister and your uh, officials uh, for a wide-ranging and a slightly longer session than we'd expected, but that's good. It shows you that you're doing your job and we're doing ours and uh, we're very pleased to, to have that. We're going to have a short suspension now uh, to allow a change of witnesses and indeed to have a comfort break.
We move on to agenda item two, which is a review of agricultural holdings legislation final report. Um, second item today is to take evidence on that review. Uh, we are joined by a panel of stakeholders and I welcome everyone to the meeting. Uh, Scott Walker, Chief Executive of uh, the National Farmers Union of Scotland. Stuart Young, Chair of Scottish Land and Estates Agricultural Holdings Strategy Group, Danecht Estates. Ken Bolt, uh, Royal Institution of uh, Chartered Surveyors. Martin Hall, Scottish Agricultural Arbiters and Valuers and representative of the Tenant Farming Forum and the former SAVA president. Mike Gascoigne, convener of the Rural Affairs Committee of the Law Society of Scotland and Christopher Nicholson, chairman of the Scottish Tenant Farmers Association. Welcome to you all. Let me kick off um, with uh, a question about uh, the idea of having a tenant farming commissioner. Um, suggested that it should be a post that's established. Do you agree that the proposed role for the Commissioner uh, would be to investigate and solve complaints against a number of codes of practice? Should the codes be statutory? And what remedies uh, would be available to such a Commissioner? Who would like to kick off? Just to indicate, Scott Walker. Um, thank you, Convener. Um, I, th I think to, to answer this question, it's, it's worthwhile just going back over a little bit of, of brief, brief history and the fact that you know, so many disputes do arise between landlords and, and tenants. And while, of course, there is recourse to, to the land court to, to solve disputes, um, that's, that recourse is problematic, uh, both in terms of cost, in terms of time, and also in terms of the atmosphere it uh, generally creates with, within, the, within the industry. So NFU Scotland has, has long advocated some sort of post of commissioner, adjudicator, something along that lines, of somebody who could be pre, you know, proactive in ter terms of disputes. Somebody could intervene, and I suppose for lack of a better description, act as an arbiter in cer certain circumstances. Because often what you need is simply somebody who brings both sides together to talk, to actually enforce um, a set of conditions that is then adhered to, to, to individuals. So given that background, the basic principle of what's proposed by the review group to us is sound. Um, I think you do need uh, compulsory codes, uh, statutory codes to be put in place. And whoever is the adjudicator or commissioner actually does need strong powers to enforce their, their, their decisions. And we think it's vital that they are proactive in, in this area. So that uh, involves basically all various issues where they can dis be disputes, whether that be about rent reviews, whether that be about way go, and also about signposting individuals how they could get the best, best advice. Sounds like a job for the United Nations. Um, um, you'd have thought that, uh, that we'd need to be more than one commissioner if uh, that's what we're talking about. Other points of view? Yes, Christopher Nicholson. Um, <clears throat> thank you, Convener. The, the Scottish Tenant Farmers Association have um, been an advocate of the creation of a tenant farming commissioner for, for a, a long time now. And we see the tenant farming commissioner as a, as a vital ingredient um, to the health of the sector going, going forward. We believe that the, the tenant farming commissioner would benefit from statutory powers and statutory codes of conduct and the ability to um, implement and, and create statutory codes um, that guide, that act as a guide to um, how landlords and tenants deal with all the processes such as WAGO and rent reviews. And furthermore, those processes must be um, able to be audited as a, a means of ensuring that the, the processes and codes have been followed correctly. In terms of what wider remits, the Tenant Farming Commissioner should be able to have, ha, should have the, the re remit to investigate complaints in the sector, monitor what's, what's happening, um, and mediate and, and, and act as arbiter, not, not only in individual situations, but also as um, in, in situations where the stakeholder groups, um, say, uh, in, in particular NFUS, SLE and STFA, where 
there, there are many areas where, where consensus can be reached, but in some, some areas, consensus will not be reached, and there's a role there for a tenant farming commissioner to act as a mediator or arbiter in those, those situations. So should the codes be statutory? Martin and then uh, Stuart. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I, um, so I a, believe that the, the codes shouldn't be statutory, that they should be voluntary codes, but that the tenant farming commissioner, whoever that may be, has teeth to enforce those codes. So the, the, there is a great deal of consensus in the industry, or there could be with a, with a bit of cajoling into, into positions so that there are voluntary codes in place covering the, the areas that need to be covered. Um, it may be that, that the, if, if codes can't be agreed upon, that, that, that the commissioner has the ability to, to introduce something more statutory, but I think the, the emphasis should be on voluntary codes rather than uh, uh, bringing about more layers of legislation that, that aren't needed at the moment. Stuart Young. Uh, good, good morning. Scottish land and states are very supportive of the concept of introducing a tenant farming commissioner. And in fact, we think we should be doing something, working with other stakeholders with a view to try and introduce an interim commissioner, given that it's going to take some time before any legislation comes into effect. And I, I believe that there's already been dialogue between um, key stakeholders to that effect. Um, as whether they should be statutory or not, I think our position is we'd rather see um, non-statutory codes of practice, but we're very open to looking at where other examples in other sectors already exist and can we learn and develop our own codes having had that opportunity. Okay. Um, Mike Russell. By Martin Hall's view that you have a non-statutory code but you give powers to a commissioner, that would seem to go in a very odd direction. Surely if you, you accept that there should be an enforcement of a, a code, then you have to have a statutory code that allows you to be very clear on both sides uh, what is to take place and if it doesn't take place, what the consequences thereafter. The, the mixture of the two would seem to me to not only to be odd but ineffective. I, if I could come back on that. Um, I, I, um, I don't think that they, they should be ineffective if there are codes there and the commissioner has teeth to, inf to be able to enforce those um, with, with, a, you know, the, the, with, with, with powers there to, 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 be, to, to make the, uh, the enforcement meaningful. Um, I, I, I have maybe difficulty understanding why, why we couldn't operate on voluntary codes. Well, because if the problem, which is the attempt, this is an attempt to resolve a problem, uh, between uh, two parties, uh, and this is the only way that is likely to have it resolved, then to do it in a way that is not statutory, that in actual fact keeps, puts too much flexibility into it, uh, won't produce any result. I mean, I, have, I represent tenant farmers who are at the end of their tether with the situation that they have with their landlords. To say to them, oh, by the way, here's a non-statutory code, and there might be somebody appointed by somebody we're not entirely sure who is, who will be able to enforce this at some stage in the future, is frankly hope deferred. I think if you're going to take action to resolve issues, then we should have the courage to take that action in a clear way which is accountable. Because a published code that is on the statute book is an accountable code. The rest of it would be subject to the vagaries of interpretation, which has not benefited many of my constituents. I think there are a couple of examples that are there that could be, that, that, you know, we have had the, we had the um, rent, rent review process, which um, is, was a code that came, the industry came about, and latterly there was the, the uh, agreement between the three stakeholders regarding um, the mechanism for rent reviews to, to um, avoid huge increases in, in rent latterly. Um, those haven't worked, which is why we're considering well, they further, worked because further legislation. So, sorry to interrupt. Um, th those haven't worked. Well, they, they have worked in part, but they would work even better with the, with the appointment of a ten tenant farming commissioner. And having clear statute. In, uh, reflecting on these points. Uh, yes. Uh, the only um, point I might add is in our recommendation that... Uh, private housing rental panel might seem to be a suitable starting point for the kind of operation that the commissioner uh, might be in charge of. It's there and it seems to work quite well. 
Thank you for that. Uh, Mr. Bolt, uh, perhaps you have a view on this that's uh, interesting. Speaking for the RICS, um, our sensation is that uh, we would be supportive of a commission, possibly not a commissioner, but possibly a board, um, to deal with process uh, so that if practice, um, if there is a problem with the way people are practicing, that that can be addressed. Um, as opposed possibly to failure to agree. Slight distinction there. Uh, so that if, because if, uh, one does hear suggestions that, that there are problems with the way people practice on both sides, um, how does one address this? A, a commission would help with that. And if it was a commission of experts who had the necessary skills, uh, perhaps at arm's length from government um, so that it's independent and people could have confidence in it because I think that is something that the sector struggles with is confidence and confidence is, is at the heart of many of the problems that we have in, in um, improving uh, relationships and making new units available. Be, should be available to the commission or commissioner. I think that that has got to be uh, thought through what the remedies are. I think we would look at penalties as the last resort. Um, there are codes of practice in which are voluntary. Um, for example, the rent review process to build a bit more time in it and force people to get going earlier, to be more open and transparent about how they're approaching it. Uh, that has been taken on board certainly within my profession, I know, um, that we are using it now, um, going out that little bit earlier, giving tenants the chance to come back, because the problem is not one-sided. It's not just that we've got landlords and their agents who you know, can be criticised for their practice, but I think I can give examples of where we have used the code of practice and where uh, we're not getting any response from a tenant. Um, I have seen examples of where landlords have left messages or sent up to 20 pieces of correspondence looking for a response uh, from tenants. So I think it cuts both ways. There are issues on both sides. And um, I think a little bit more dialogue on um, whether they should and what penalties they should be. But I would look for them to be, I think, the way it is now. The land court have, have indicated that in the event that one party has followed the code of practice and one party hasn't, then regard might be had for that. So there is an incentive there to follow the code of practice. Yeah. Okay. Um, Dave um, Thompson had a small supplementary in this before yeah. I come back to Christian Aller. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Convener. Just to follow up from Ken Bolt's point, uh, you're, you're saying you have evidence there that, that it's not just the landowners and their agents but also tenants who haven't followed a code of practice. But surely that then must lead you to the conclusion that the commissioner and the codes of practice must have a statutory basis so that all parties must follow them. Because that's the problem with your voluntary system. People don't need to follow it, and it leads to problems on both sides. Therefore, if you've got a commission with clearly set out responsibilities if you have codes of practice which would be developed through discussion that have a statutory, that, he, that that commissioner can apply uh, statutorily, then the commissioner has an ability to pull people together. And if that commissioner also had a role, not just in a legal sense, but in a sense of mediation, where mediators, either the commissioner could do it or he could take on professional mediators, and we've got many good ones in Scotland that could get people together to work their way through the statutory codes, etc. You've got a very robust system then that is going to be fair to everyone. So do you agree or accept my logic? I don't disagree. Uh, but I, I can only speak from my own experience. 
uh, where I act for both landlords and tenants. And as always, the vast majority of people are reasonable. But there's only one or two that you meet. Uh, and for example, the one that I mentioned uh, where we had used the new code of practice uh, for the rent review, and it took about 20 phone calls, letters uh, to the tenant, we persevered. We didn't need to go. And, and I've been in practice over 30 years. I've never ended up having to have a rent dispute settled by arbitration, nor have I ever ended up at the land court. And I'm sure there's a lot of people in practice would say the same. Uh, so I'm, from my experience, I've never needed it. You have the land court sitting out there, and everyone knows that whether you're a landlord or a tenant, if you end up going to the land court, it's an expensive business. I don't think anyone would be wanting to go to the land court if they can avoid it, but from what you're saying there, it sounds like it's all rosy and working really well, and we can all just go home now. Uh, well, uh, certainly, that, that is my own experience. It, it's at variance with some others, but uh, that's my experience. A little bit further, and you can come in in a minute, Scott Walker, because uh, on the point about the French safer system, we have a French national here. Who wants yeah, to? I, I, I was quite intrigued with the, uh, the submission that we had from the STFA. Uh, maybe Christopher Nicholson wants to talk about it. Uh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm a great fan of uh, SAFE or SAFER, whatever we want to call it. Uh, but I wanted to inquire what exactly do you think we should take from SAFE uh, for the Commission or the Commission or whatever we decide to have? Uh, to, to what example were you thinking of? Um, w w one of the key benefits we see of a, of a, a, a commissioner or an organisation like Safair is that they um, can ensure that um, the, the buying and selling of land and also the letting of land is carried out in the public interest and in a manner that would benefit the lo local community and agriculture in, in that area. So my understanding of Safair is that if, um, if there is, a, for example, a land sale, the SAFAIR are required to approve the, the purchaser and, and have the power to intervene if they think that someone else is more suitable to occupy that land. And in the same way, that land, um, they have a say over approving who the, who the tenant of let land is. So they're ensuring that land is managed and occupied in the public benefit. You think that SAFA, in fact, uh, will come out after the event? It's maybe the safer way to do it. Sorry? After the event of, of uh, whatever his tenants or whatever is acquiring land, it's, it's better to do it afterwards, after the sales or after the tra tra transaction. Than I, think, I think they should approve the transaction. I think the transaction happen. If, don't take me wrong, the transaction happen, and then after it's got to go through SAFAIR to decide if, uh, if... If it's acceptable. If it's acceptable yeah. or not. Is it that you are... A, a role, we think that a, a tenant farming commissioner could have a role like that, and there are examples in, in um, for, for example, one of the recommendations in, the, in this Ag Holdings review report is that um, s s s there will be certain opportunities to assign tenancies out with farming, tenanted farming families. And we see that there is a role for an organisation such as Safair or a commissioner to approve who the new assignee is. Otherwise, there's a danger of um, simply the, the biggest operators um, taking up all the opportunities. Yeah. Can we get the comment maybe from the panel? Or not? Uh, well, indeed, um, I'm just going to say we are going to come on to assignation and things like that, I guess, in more detail later. But Scott Walker, on this related point about the commissioner and yeah, the SAFAIR yeah. process. Yeah, I go, going back to about the commissioner and, and sta statutory codes, uh, the, the reason we're here and the reason we've got the review groups situation is because the, the current system isn't working satisfactory. And I think everyone agrees that we want to move to a situation where for existing tenants, things are thought of as being fair. And we're also creating an environment where people actually want to rent land out 
in, in the future. So that, that's the ultimate aim we, are, we wish, to, wish to get to. And there are pl plenty of situations where everyone around the table can say where things are working fine, you know, because there are situations where things are, are working fine. But there's also plenty of situations where there is a dispute where things aren't working. And the Tenant Farm Forum, for instance, did come up with a very good voluntary code, how to conduct rent reviews, the process that people should, should go through. And I think that would be the basis, for instance, of any new commissioner, I would suggest, of looking at codes, codes in the future. But the nature of voluntary codes is that where you've got two reasonable parties, they'll agree to it and they'll work, work with it. But where we have either of the parties who aren't reasonable, or perhaps there's a whole series of events that have occurred before, beforehand, they don't stick to, to that. And I think for that reason, you know, statutory codes that are enforceable by a commissioner is hugely important if you're going to bring confidence back, back, to, back to the sector. And it's that commissioner and that intervention and that fact that you don't have to go to land court or there isn't the threat of having to go to land court uh, to de settle disputes is for us what would make the commissioner's job uh, successful. Because if we have a commissioner, but it still requires individuals to go to land court, then in our view, the commissioner will not be effective and the role of the commissioner will not do what it's supposed to do, which is to settle disputes, intervene where there are disputes and bring confidence to the sector. Russell. I wanted to press Scott a little on that. I mean, you've defined the purposes of the Commissioner uh, in a very utilitarian manner, which is to uh, find some way of resolving difficulties between those <coughs> who cannot resolve them themselves. But what you haven't done is to take the step that, that Christopher had taken and that, that, that Safur has done, which is to have a wider test, which is a test of community benefit. It doesn't seem to me that the state, per se, would have a role in simply making either sides in a dispute happier. You know, that, that is Ken's job if he can do it. And given Ken has never, uh, he says, met a difficult situation here, I'm going to follow him around the country to see how he does it. But the concept of the public good is the, is the reason why the state would be involved in appointing commissioner. And I agree that commissioner or commission should be at arm's length. And it is that issue which, you know, land reform and the wider issue of land reform, which we'll come into, onto, uh, has to address. It is the wider public benefit and the use of the resource of land in the interests both of the community in which it is set and the wider country that we really need to start addressing. And I do think that needs to be factored into how you're seeing the role of the Commissioner. Um, I, I think in both public goods and in the consideration of where there's market failure, and we'll talk about later on, I suspect, about, say, rent reviews, for instance, where there's market failure uh, because you don't have a clear market for certain form, forms of tenancy. So therefore, that's why you need to set up a statutory mechanism in, in place, place to deal with it. I also think, therefore, we're looking at other aspects of you know, wider legislation that's going through par Parliament just now. And when you look at land in Scotland, for NFU Scotland, one of the presumptions of land is that it should be used for food production. You know, that's what we should be, be looking at for. And when you look at public good and public benefit and what people are using land, land for, then the driver for us would be that you're using that for agriculture and you're using it for food production. And they are the reasons why legislation and government intervention is justified. Okay, um, Chris John, continue, I think, along some... Yes. And, and we just talked about um, uh, making sure that, uh, that we've got a good uh, partnership between the, the landlord and the tenants. The relationship has to improve. I know we heard about uh, that everything is rosy, somebody <laughs> said early on. Uh, uh, we've got to make sure that implementing the recommendation of the review uh, will involve legislation and uh, will be followed by a number of initiatives, development of codes of practice and guidance. And I would like to know uh, from the panel, different organisations, how... Uh, you would help shape opinions to improve that relationship between the landlord and the tenants. Stuart Young, yes. I think that the state, key stakeholders have got a fundamental role to play there in working together. Um, I think they've already demonstrated that they can do that, um, uh, having set up the, the rent panel last year, which I think has had some positive effect um, certainly using it in practical application. Personally, I've seen um, 
it have positive effect. So I think that some good ground could be made by the stakeholders getting together, closing the door, and working through these things together. into that debate, making sure that everybody trusts the, the process, that we have a, 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 the common good of what we want to see in the countryside, uh, uh, the, the, the tone of the debate and, and what's going to go thereafter, uh, it will be based around that trust between <coughs> the different elements, your organization, landlords and tenants. Anybody wants to comment on that? Christopher. Um, in the in the past, in the last decade, um, stakeholders have have got together in what was called the, the Tenant Farming Forum, the TFF, which, to my mind, was a, a large, cumbersome body which uh, wasn't very satisfactory at de dealing with um, problems or coming up with solutions. In the last year, um, the th th three of the main stakeholders have have set up, for example, the the rent panel and the joint initiative, which is between STFA and FUS and and SLE. And that seems to be working much better. And this debate about landlord and tenants is about that. It's, it's about improving relationships between landlords and tenants. And we would like to encourage landlords to become more evident in the, in the debate. I know, I know Stuart is here today, but I feel quite strongly that it should have been a, a, a landowner or a landlord representing landlords rather than... Um, a professional agent and no no objection to, to, to Stuart but um, I think we have to do whatever we can to create greater landlord involvement and ensure that landlords are determining their lot ha, ha, what the best interests are in the long term for their their um, estates ra rather than landlords being represented through professional advisors um, and it's a good point. I, I met a lot of times too with my neighbour. I never met the person who employs him. Um, Claudia Beamish and then uh, Scott Walker. Yeah. Good morning to, to the panel. Uh, I, it was on that point which has been raised about intermediaries that I'd just like to um, get the views of the panel on a quote that actually comes from the, the review which says that, and I quote, many submissions have alleged that inexperienced or insensitive intermediaries at times cause a souring of landlord-tenant relationships, which is both unhelpful and unnecessary. Others have suggested there may be what amounts to an excessive use of professional intermediaries to the exclusion of any personal contact between landlord and tenant. And I highlight this particular last point I'm going to read now because it, it does give me serious cause for concern in terms of the, the, the future. Um, because it says, I go on, in regard the number of landlords who have chosen to contribute to the review itself through a professional intermediary has been notable. Could I have comments from the panel on that as to why that would be the case and how anyone thinks that's helpful to the future of relationships? Scott Walker and then Stuart Young um, for the moment. Uh, um, I... I'm tempted to just say yes to your to your question, uh, in in the sense of I I, I hesitate I hesitate in what what I say because I know I'm going to be lambasted from from some somebody as as a as a consequence of it, but the the situation is that for many landlords and many tenants, the relationships good when the two individuals talk. They know what's trying to be achieved. They know what the long-term objective is, and, and they can come, they can come come together. There, there's many situations out, out there, and do use use the term many situations out, out there, where you get agents involved, which in some degrees is professionalising the relationship, but in other degrees, certainly in recent years, has often been say the the conflict for the views that it's trying to escalate rents, and in terms of the relationships that have built up those relationships aren't the same relationships as used to exist in the past between the landlord and, and, and the tenant. So I do think in certain agents seem to have a reputation that goes in front of them. Some people would call them hard negotiators. Other people would say that they fly pretty close to, to, the, to the wind. 
but it doesn't build up that trust and that long-term relationship. And that goes back then to the point beforehand about, about trust. Is It's not something you can create over, overnight, and it's something that has to be worked on and built upon. And it doesn't take much to damage it. And then it gets people, unfortunately, in a, a way of thinking that they enter into discussions feeling that either side isn't being wholly honest or either side is looking at it from a slightly different different angle and it clouds all the discussions that, that take, takes place. And that's why I say for NFU Scotland, it's important that we get legislation passed in this parliament. We, we get that sort of framework there that everyone knows on how they can work, work with it. And I certainly believe that whether it's SLE or STFA or NFU Scotland, there, there is a mindset amongst the three organisations to make this work. And there's a mindset amongst all the organisations to ensure that there's a fair deal for tenants, there's a fair deal for, for landlords, and there's actually the encouragement out there to get people to look at renting out land, whether that's your traditional estates or whether that's your owner-occupied farms going, going out. On why did landlords uh, get agents to, you know, reply to the submission? I'll maybe leave that to, to Stuart to say to say something, something on on, on that aspect. Stuart, Ken. Okay. Uh, thank you. F firstly, Christian, the invitation to meet Charles Pearson will be in the post tomorrow. Um, but uh, I'm not sure I understand why there should be a, a view that. Um, an agent or an intermediary responding to um, consultation or input to the review group should be a, a difficulty. I mean, I, using my own example, I, mean, I, I, I like to think that I know how my principal thinks and works. That's what I'm employed to do. It's part of my function, part of my role. He's got wide and varied business interests that consume his time. That's why I'm there, and therefore I'll put in responses and submissions and and hopefully represent his position very a accurately. Ken? I respond briefly to that. It, it, it's, this is purely a personal view that if, if it's something as important as it is to the future of the relationship between landlords and tenants, that I would have hoped that there would be more direct submissions from landlords of whatever scale for this specific review. That's the point I'm making. Um, that, that I don't know that necessarily intermediaries are helpful. And let's be real about this. There are a lot of tenant farmers who can't afford the professional advice of intermediaries in the way that larger landlords have. And I think the business interests of the landlord should perhaps be focused at the time of the review on, on making a contribution. That's just my personal view. And then Ken Bolt with Tuck. So, sorry, again, to use my own personal example, but as we're talking about directly about intermediaries and I'm one, before I, before I will submit anything, I will run that past my principal. He will read it before it's submitted. So it's, it's a, he, he is seeing exactly what's being said to represent his, his opinion. Uh, well, Ken Bolt and then Christopher Nicholson. Yeah. I think the, <clears throat> the RICS took a keen interest when there was a suggestion... Uh, in the media uh, was picked up the points you've made that um, the intermediaries, the agents, the factors were at the heart of the problem. Why I was, why I was asking the question, just yeah. so we're quite clear about that. Yeah. Well, it may not be your view. No, no, no. But I'm just saying that it wasn't because of what I've read in the media yeah. that, that I was raising that issue, <coughs> Chair. Sorry. No, no, no. <coughs> And, and the response within um, my profession, the Royal Institution of Chartered Surveyors, was, uh, on my part, it didn't, it didn't ring true with my experience in that this relationship of trust and confidence, which uh, Christian has talked about, I think is at the heart of working uh, on a rural uh, estate uh, with let land. It's something that um, most of the people within the profession spend a lot of time investing. Um, you don't go in to do a rent review and then disappear forever. So you've got a lot of things. You have an ongoing relationship. Some of these relationships have gone through the generations, um, over 100 years, some of the tenancies. So there is a long... And, and it's in everyone's interests that 
you have a good working relationship. Um, absolutely key. Uh, the RICS took an interest in it. Uh, we had various meetings of all the big players in Scotland. I've never seen them all in a room before uh, because a lot of them were seriously offended by what had been suggested because it didn't ring with them. Um, we spoke, I think, to Andrew Thin, came along to the meeting because I think he was the one who went public with it. Um, and the RICS said, look, we have a code of practice. We expect the very highest standard of our members. Uh, and if any uh, member steps out of line, they get dragged up by the professional practice section. Uh, very strictly, they very worried about the reputation of the profession. They have a lot of members in Scotland, um, and it's very important that we retain our reputation. Um, they made it clear that we have not had one single formal complaint. They said, give us a complaint and we will investigate it. So there wasn't one single complaint. Mm -hmm. to. So some of these things are very easy to say, but if you don't evidence them, you leave, a, a professional body can't act against members on hearsay. It's got to do it on the basis of some representation of the facts, and it's never had the benefit of that. So the professional body has made it abundantly clear to the people who may be suggesting this, come forward, we will deal with it. And the, and the RICS not only has its own code of practice, it also has a royal charter. So it has a duty to consider the public interest as well. So if there's something that isn't necessarily against the way, but has, is in the public interest, they are prepared to take that up as well. We've got a lot of questions to get through just now, and uh, the Tenant Farming Forum and others have been running through these same issues for the last 10 years, and I don't think we want to spend as much time today uh, as those 10 years. Uh, it's a fair point that you've made. Um, Christopher, uh, Nicholson asked to respond to it, but I really have to move on to, well, Dave, is it about a particular case or is it about the general principle? Because the point is, if you've, got a if you've got a code of practice in Rex and it's not yeah. statutory, how can it ever be enforced? Mm. It's, the fundamental it's, a, it's a general thing. principle, but uh, if Chris wants to come in, yeah, it'll be, uh, be very quick. And very uh, yeah, quickly. Uh, 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 over the weekend, I read a statistical account of agriculture in the southwest Scotland written in 1875, and the last couple of pages looked at the tenanted sector 140 years ago. And the author pointed out a, an emerging problem that many landlords were handing over responsibility for the management of their estates to outside agents. And the author felt that this was resulting in short-term policies for the management of the estates that not only was not in the interest of tenant farming and agriculture in general, but it wasn't even in the landlord's long-term interest. And I think that's as true today as it was 140 years ago. And if there was more landlord involvement in, in, in policy and, and how estates are run and taking a long-term view, we might see different policy being put forward from landlords today and also, I think we'd see easier dispute resolutions if landlords actually were more willing to sit down and talk with, with tenants rather than through intermediaries. Well, there we are. We've had a range of opinions on that. Dave, very quickly. Well, thank you very Let's much, Convene, Aaron. I, I just want to, to comment on, on Ken Bolt's comments and about trust and confidence and so on. Just going through the various submissions, I just think it's interesting, and I'll just uh, comment on this, that in relation to a number of the issues, the... RICs take the diametrically opposed position more almost, uh, you know, to, say, STFA. And I'm looking at the rent review recommendations, freedom of contract, extension of assignation, conversion of secure tenancies to LDT, preemptive right to buy, absolute right to buy, conditional right to enforce sale and ministerial right to intervene. I just think it's interesting that RICs position is the opposite position to the STFA. And, I, you know, I don't see any effort in there to be balanced in relation to what I might expect a professional organisation to do. So it's pretty obvious uh, that he who pays the piper is calling the tune in relation to Rick's. Okay. Um, 
point of view do you want to come back at all but we'll be coming back in each of the individual issues uh, starting off with uh, I think the only point I would make is that Rick's members represent both sides uh, and I think that what, what we've done is try to put our response together from uh, the experience that Rick's members have got and I, I you know, I, th I think it's, it's probably fair comment to say that um, the owner of the land is often better resourced than the tenant. That's a, a fact of life, and they probably more frequently seek professional advice. Um, but I think uh, what Ricks has tried to do is to try to, you know, for example, on the rent review, uh, rent review is a challenging exercise anyway, and we're maybe going to come to it further. But it's coming a challenge. to it just straight away. Oh, well, wait. <laughs> well, I was going to say, it's a, it's a challenging uh, exercise for, uh, for anyone, for professionals. Uh, we try to do it as best we can. As I say, I have never personally ended up in the land court or in front of an arbiter. Um, but we put a lot of effort into trying to get our rent reviews done as fairly and as reasonably and as openly as we can. And I'm not saying it is a rose garden because there's always difficult characters uh, on both sides that are difficult characters. But um, our worry is that the suggestions for the new proposals based on budgets, we well, like the principle of, of that the rent should be based on the productivity of the farm. I think we should come to that in terms of the actual detail of rents, which is what Sarah Boyack was about to lead on, rather than you know, stray over into the detail of it in terms of uh, the principles that Dave Thompson was mentioning. Please go ahead, Sarah. Thanks very much, Convener. Um, I've got a series of questions around the whole issue of rent and rent reviews, which even just in the, the first few minutes of this session is clearly... Um, a major issue. Um, it's certainly been an issue that this committee is periodically taking evidence on um, and it was a key issue addressed in the review. So I want to ask some questions around the recommendations of the review. Um, so first of all, um, was really to pick up that last question, that last point uh, we were just hearing about in terms of the issue of how rents are set and the principles on which rents are set. Um, and we're just getting into that just in the last comment about the, the different suggestion between um, that suggested by the NFUS and the SFTA, which would focus on productive capacity, the capacity to work the farm and raise revenue from it, versus the RICS approach, as I read it, which is about a fair rent, which is more commercially driven. And I think this goes to the heart of some of the discussions we, we were having here about um, whether or not we regard agricultural tenancies as important or not, to what extent we want to attach a priority to that in terms of food production, and environmental management um, and the issue about if rents get too high because you've got competition for them or because um, the rent is seen as a commercial rent strictly rather than the capacity of the farm to deliver, you've potentially got a barrier to tenant farmers in terms of the capacity to raise money and invest. So there's the first point about the principle here and the second point, and I'll come back with other detailed questions, but the second point would be about the difference of setting rent for different types of tenancies. Um, people who've got more long-term secure tenancies uh, versus those who've got much more limited duration tenancies. And just to ask for some views around whether you think uh, the process should be different um, and also whether the principle should be different for different types of tenancies. Thank you, computer. Right, who wants to start off then? I'm going to try and keep this short answers and uh, absolutely to the point. So, Scott Walker. Right. Uh, if I deal with, say, the two, two extremes, so you've got secure tenancies or annual grass, grass lets. Um, annual grass lets, some crazy prices are paid for annual grass lets on, on, the, on the year, yearly basis. Uh, but I think that that should be left to the marketplace. <clears throat> and there's specific circumstances each year that will affect that, that, those rental prices. Once we see cap bed down, hopefully we'll see some sense and sensibility get into, into grass, grass let market. 
If you look at the, the other extreme in terms of sec secure, secure tenancies, what the review group has come out up with, looking at you know the productive capacity of the land, looking at some standardisations, costings in terms of how you set the, set the rents, we think that's a sensible way to, to go, go forward. And what we really need now is more detail on how that mechanism would actually actually work and how um, that would actually be implemented in, in practice. But I think there is a, there's a broad consensus within the industry that what's been suggested by the review group in terms of secure tenants' rents is, is a sensible progression on what we have at the present time. Christopher Nicholson here. Um, yeah, yes, ever since the open market rent test was introduced in 1958, tenants have, have argued to have it removed. So um, we, we see the recommendation on rents as one of the most significant features of, of this um, review's report. Um, it's important that a, f a fair rent is, is set on the productive capacity to allow a, a landlord a fair return on his investment and also the tenant a fair return on the fixed equipment that he has provided. Um, our belief is that in, in any tenancy where the um, tenant is providing a significant amount of fixed equipment, so that those are secure tenancies and the longer term LD, LDTs, the rent test should be based on the productive capacity. Um, th that's because you're looking at a situation where the, the, the tenant and the landlord are investing capital. And because of the scarcity and distortion of the land market that we have in Scotland at the moment, unless you have it on productive capacity, it means that the landlord is taking away a greater proportion of the rent that he should have when it's set in the open market and the tenant is not left with a sufficient return for his investments. So a move to the, open, to the productive capacity from the open market should ensure a fairer distribution of the divisible surplus to both parties. Yes, Stuart Young. Yeah. Scottish Land Estates members um, have recognised the um, views that have been put forward by STFA and NFUS vis-à-vis -a, -vis a move towards a productive capacity test, and that's something that we're prepared to... Um, uh, work with and see um, worked up, but I, we, we feel that it's um, something where we need to really get into working some practical examples so we can actually see how that um, flowchart in the review group's report would actually work in practice. Um, so we're, we're not certainly not wedded to um, a, uh, the retention of any open market test. So far as um, uh, such so secure tenancies, so far as um, new tenancies are concerned, we're of the view that um, in any new LDT that the um, position should be that the parties are free to agree the um, uh, uh, rent setting mechanism and if there's no such agreement that there should be a default position back to the uh, same productive capacity basis. Okay. Um, does anyone else want to comment on this just now? Uh, to say there's questions? Yes, uh, Martin. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, the productive capacity um, basis has is, is a, is a, is always been a, is a, a starting point for setting rents in any case, so there's a, there's a strong logic for that. Um, I think Sava would certainly like to see some examples worked up, but are, are at the moment slightly concerned because we're involved in dispute resolution. We're concerned that it looks to be as if it's going to introduce more capacity for dispute than already exists. Um, we would like that not to be the case, but it's just flagging it up as a, as a practical difficulty we see on the horizon. That would be the case. Yeah, because there are, um, within productive capacity there are so many more variables that uh, are of a subjective view than, uh, than exists at the present. So it would basically mean people would be coming to the table with um, historic um, information about how well farms have uh, performed and doing some comparative work in different parts of the country about what would be reasonable to expect. Even within local areas, there are huge variances between, say, you know, if you're dealing with grade three land, whether it grows one and a half tons of barley or three tons of barley, um, whether the ground can carry one beast per acre or, or two beasts per acre, and they have huge um, variations, uh, potential to vary, have large variations in the rent. And you've also got the potential that you have to look at the hypothetical tenant, 
and, and that, that exists at the moment. But, but if you're looking at farming systems, you've certainly got the uh, uh, strong ability to upset a tenant farmer if you're suggesting that he's not farming it in perhaps the manner that it, sh that, 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 that it could be farmed in. Um, that's okay, different uh, to the system he's yeah. operating in at the moment. That's useful. I've got a couple of follow-up questions. Um, uh, one about uh, the extent to which diversification with the tenant would be taken on board in terms of setting rent reviews. And the other one is the issue about where there's spare housing on the holding, which is part of the farm, but it's not necessarily being used, and how those things should affect uh, valuations for fair rent. OK, who wants to comment on that? Anyone in particular? Christopher Nicholson. Um, in, in terms of diversification, we wel welcome the proposals that should enable um, tenants uh, an easier road to gaining landlord consent to diversify. Um, in terms of setting the rents for diversifications, um, we should be aware that existing diversifications, um, rental agreements have already been arrived at, um, and, and some of those we may not want to o override. However, go, going forward, we're, we're, we're in agreement with the proposals that a landlord should have a return for what he has provided as, as part of the diversification. So if he has contributed to a, a building, then, then there should be a, a fair rent apportioned to, to him. And in ter terms of housing, we feel that um, the housing is part of the fixed equipment of the farm, and that, that was the way the farm was let at the start of the lease. Um, it, is fairly, we, th we think it could be problematic going down the road of um, attributing uh, a rental value to su surplus housing, which may be used f for part-time farm workers, for ex example. Um, uh, Claudia Beamish, first of all, I want to come back on a more general point. In this. Right, it's just a, a quick point to follow up on the point made by, by you, Martin, about the productive capacity. Uh, I don't want to put words in your mouth or in, in the rest of the panel at all, but would it be the case that the move from historic to area payments would help with um, these definitions as, as cases build up, you know, in view of the fact that there's the, the three, well, the two rough grazing and the, and the other area? Surely that would help to simplify the, the definitions of productive land. Um, it will help. Yes, mm -hmm. but, but even within those, those um, bands, there are huge variations, mm -hmm. for, particularly band one, for instance. Yeah. Uh, large variations in the quality of that land. Um, right, okay. And productive capacity. Okay. Just going to answer the question and say that Scottish Land Estates were supportive of these um, proposals that the review group came up with vis a vis diversification and housing. I mean, the issue of surplus housing has been a uh, th somewhat fo thorny one in rent reviews um, and uh, I think that the approach that they've suggested is very sensible. I went to improvements and many things like that just in a minute or two but uh, just a point you know given that the market value was starting to be taken into account as Christopher Nicholson says under a 1958 government Tory government then um, you're obviously seeing means to move away from uh, that kind of approach. Would I be right in thinking that uh, the decline in tenancies, which have been going on for decades, um, has got some of its roots in that particular move towards free market values and rents, and that indeed the arguments that have taken place in more recent decades have further reduced the number of tenancies, but that that was one of the starting points where uh, the realities of farming and uh, the market got completely out of kilter. I, I, I think that's, uh, th there's a, l a lot of truth in that, in that the ability to set a uh, rent that is isn't viable in the long term is one reason why many tenants have given up. And it's also, in, in some extreme examples, used as a means for a landlord to um, coerce a tenant to give up through the setting of a, of a non-viable rent. Any more comments on that point? Yeah, Ken Ball. From the RICS's point of view, we remain uh, convinced that having a market um, check on rents is uh, a sound way forward 
uh, it's the way we approach all valuations, whether it's a rent, we look at historically what comparables are out there. In the agricultural um, scene, um, Christopher has talked about scarcity and how the lack of availability of land uh, results in too many people competing for too few farms and very high rents being tendered. Uh, but it also has to be acknowledged that we already have a process uh, for people who are looking at comparables. Uh, you, are, you have, under the existing um, arrangements um, governed by the existing legislation, you have got to extract scarcity. Uh, not an easy thing to do, um, we did it recently on one holding um, where we, we put it on the open market, um, we secured a rent, and we ended up using for a comparable purpose probably about 50% of what was achieved on the open market. So, so we weren't taking a figure that's achieved in the open market and going to sitting tenants and saying, no, we're going to have to double your rents because we realised we'd start the next Jacobite revolution. Uh, and what we had to do was to consider um, a lot of other factors and adjust it for scarcity, the evidence for scarcity, uh, and use a much, much lower figure. So the fact that there are few holdings available and that open market tenders are higher, there already is an adjustment um, to ease uh, the negotiations for, for sitting tenants. But um, we're going to explore that all a good deal further just in a minute or two because we want to look at investment, improvement, compensation and we go. Jim Hume. Thank you very much, uh, Convener. Um, you're talking about access to finance, so obviously for tenants that's uh, an extremely important part. So recommendation nine is uh, recommending that we should consider uh, registering tenants, tenancies in the land register so that uh, uh, those uh, tenancies could therefore be borrowed uh, again, so I wonder what the panel's views are on that. Also, the recommendation 10 is recommending a, a three-year amnesty regarding uh, Wago's uh, improvements. Uh, there's been many improvements made by tenants which have not been registered, so also wondering what the, the panel's views are on the amnesty to allow tenants to register their, their improvements. And further to that, obviously, um, I would be interested in the panel's views on any um, changes in the WIGO protocols for, for the future uh, moving forward? Okay, right. Christopher Nicholson, to start off. Um, we're, we're pleased that the review group did re recognise an evolving investment pattern on tenanted farms, which means that in the secure tenanted sector, um, tenants are having to provide a, a, an ever greater um, amount of capital for fixed equipment. Um, we, we d disagree with one of their f f findings that suggests that they didn't see any evidence for differences in investment levels between um, owner-occupied and tenanted farms. We, we think there's a, a huge amount of evidence, the length and breadth of, of Scotland, and the lack of investment in the tenanted sector is, is a, a real concern to the future health of the sector. N now, the review group have got, gone down a certain... Um, but at least stage one of trying to um, allow greater ability for the tenant to raise raise capital by recommending that a, a secure tenancy should be re registered with the registers of Scotland and allow it to be used for mortgage purposes, i.e. grant a, uh, a lender to grant a standard security over the, the registered lease. However, um, as the RICS paper points out, maybe there's not a bit of thinking that's not been joined up here in, in that that is only of benefit to a mortgage provider if, it's, if the value is realisable. And because secure tenancies are, are not allowed, a restrict, freedom of assignation is restricted on secure tenancies, the value of that registered tenancy is not realisable because it's not tradable. So they've gone sort of stage one but haven't completed stage two. And the alternative they have got is that uh, secure tenancies could be converted to uh, a 35, minimum term 35-year LDT and assigned for value. But we fail to see how um, an improvement that is, may have a lifespan of 100 years or more can maintain its value under a lease of only 35 five years. 
Um, so we question whether that means to realise value will ever realise true value of improvements. We also question uh, the compl possible complexities of going through the conversion process, um, which leads to quite a few un uncertainties. And I don't think a, a mortgage provider or a, a, a bank would be willing to take the risks of, of going through a lengthy con conversion process that's uncertain. They would rather have a, a easier means of realising value if the worst came to the worst and they had to call in the security. Um, so I, I think there needs to be a bit more thought in how tenants go about raising finance for improvements. And you have to bear in mind that there's no obligation on the, on the landlord to provide modern improvements. Landlords are only obliged to provide what was considered necessary at the start of the lease. And in most secure tenancies, the start of the lease date, predates modern farm improvements. Um, on the next point, on the amnesty, this, we feel this is a... a, a of great benefit to the tenanted sector. There are a lot of tenants who've um, lost their letters of notice or there's uncertainty over who provided um, the improvement. Um, it's important that all tenants' improvements are covered by the amnesty. And there are two... So we, we're in full support of the recommendation, but there are two aspects of the recommendation in, in the review that we, we think is uh, problematic. Um, one is the recommendation that any um, improvement where th that isn't tenant's improvement where the tenant doesn't notify the landlord during the amnesty period is assumed to revert to the landlord. Well, that is a, a, a plain contravention of, of, of property rights of the, of the tenant. There, are, there will be many tenants who, who no doubt don't take advantage of the amnesty, and we don't see why... Uh, someone who doesn't take advantage of the, of the arm, amnesty should run the risk of losing his, his improvements. And also, we foresee the potential for disputes. And there needs to be, and this is a role for a commissioner, there needs to be a form of dispute resolution for this amnesty period and, and the disputes that may arise from it. At the moment, the 1991 Act prevents disputes over improvements being referred to alternative dispute resolution. The default is the land court. There's no alternative. And we feel that that could be a major limitation on the amnesty. Without tenants knowing that there's an alternative to the land court, it, this proposal may, may serve little purpose. We've had a long submission there, but uh, I think it's uh, got to the nub of the matter. Um, other comments on that particularly? So we'll start off with Scott Walker and then go to Stuart Young. Yeah. Uh, take, taking th the three, three points, you know, firstly with regards to investment, because of the low profitability in agriculture, you know, investment is difficult for, for a tenant. You know, one of the advantages an owner-occupier will always have is that security of land and appreciation in land values and the fact that you know, the banks are, you know, have far greater certainty in terms of lending when it's supporting with that underlying asset of, of the land. So I think that's a, you know, a factual uh, situation. With regards to uh, the registration of, of the Secure Act tenancies, uh, the principle, yes, is good, uh, but we doubt whether it will make any big difference to the banks in ter terms of them either uh, providing finance to tenants or on the basis that they provide finance to tenants. So principle, good, but we won't think it will make, it, make a big, big difference. In, in terms of Wago, um, you know, virt virtually everything that, that Christopher says, you know, to totally agree with on, on that. The issue with Wago is that over a long period of time, not all improvements have been properly recorded and notified, and that can often cause, you know, one of the disputes uh, for certain rents, or it can cause certainly a dispute and also uncertainty if a tenant is thinking about leaving the holding, what is he actually going to get for the purpose of, of Wago? So we very much see this, this amnesty as, uh, as an opportunity to catch up on all that. So starting from the principle that wherever the tenant has invested in the holding and improved the holding, the presumption should be that that's uh, compensated for at the point of Wago. 
uh, this amnesty provides the opportunity for that to take, take place. So I think the onus is on the industry, if we do go forward on this basis, is to make sure that everyone knows about the amnesty, everyone knows what they've got to do in that time. And I think if it brings all the records of condition up to scratch and brings all the details um, up, to, up, up, to, up to date, that will be of huge benefit for the industry going forward. I think then taking on the point that, that Chris, Christopher said, even once you've got there, the issue that you have now is that individuals still feel that at the point of leaving the tenancy, are they going to fully get the amount of money that, 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 that they should, should get? Now, in most situations, landlords will pay the amount of money that, that the tenant should, should get. But in certain situations, there can be a dispute between the two parties. And with the only recourse being the land court, the length of time that's associated with the land court and the course that's associated with the land court, we really need a far quicker uh, dispute mechanism. So to me, this is the type of thing where, you know, sort of expert determination would be, you know, the classic way to inter intervene on this. And that should be something that the commissioner, for, for instance, could impose upon the two parties if they couldn't come to a settlement between themselves. And Stuart Young. I'm going to deal with the, the issue of the amnesty f first. It was a proposal that Scottish Land Estates originally um, put forward, and I'm, I think you'll find that there's a considerable degree of consensus between STFA and NFUS and Scottish Land Estates on it. What, one particular point that I would like to emphasise is that I think we should try and um, limit the time period over which we record improvements to one year rather than three years, as suggested in the review. I think that settling that brings considerable advantage, particularly in the, in the um, process of uh, rent review, whereby you want to firmly establish whose fixed equipment is whose. So if we can do that sooner rather than later, then hopefully that will prevent the prospect of dispute when it comes to setting rents. Um, I, I was going to hold off on talking about um, uh, conversion and succession at this moment in time, so I imagine it's a question you're going to uh, come to. Um, the point about security and the ability to grant a security on a, on a lease, um, we've taken some uh, soundings from lenders and the banks have to told us that this isn't an issue for them. What they want to know is about the serviceability of their loan. They want to know about the track record of the applicant and they want to know about their overall balance sheet position. So I'm not convinced that it's the um, factor that's holding back investment in holdings. And uh, Martin uh, Hall. Yeah. Um, really just supporting the amnesty and the practical um, benefits that that would bring about for, for rent reviews and at Wigo because there is a great deal of uncertainty over that and it would certainly assist in that process if we could bring that into being. Yeah, given the protracted nature of some of these discussions about who owns what and to whom. Yeah, my, 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 my personal view is I don't think one year is enough. Um, I think it would, it's just too tight to, to, to capture all of those noticed, yeah. improvements in that time. Yeah, the SL and E said one. Yeah. Okay, I just thought I would uh, mix it a little there. Um, Jim, yeah? I think we're probably finishing off, off, off that yeah. question, but... Uh, I didn't really hear anybody saying that we, sh we shouldn't have an, an amnesty. The recommendation is, is three, so I think that's quite, quite encouraging uh, regarding WEGO. Uh, there wasn't too much talked about WEGO protocol, obviously, well, and, but some of that I think will come into assignation, which we're going, going on to next. Um, there's quite a broad consensus regarding the dispute mechanism we have at the moment not, not being correct. And uh, I think of, there's a concurrence with Christopher Nicholson's view uh, that also um, there is a similar amount of investment when it's an owner-occupier and when it's a tenant, as evidence doesn't seem to agree with that. And we've had evidence in the past regarding SRDP where tenant farmers go for management options and uh, owner-occupiers are going for more capital options. So I just thought I'd finish off on that point before we go into assignation. Uh, Martin, yeah. Jimmy, um, the, 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 it isn't correct that there is the, the default position is, is to the land court for Wago valuations, but actually in practice, 
Um, it's a very rare occasion that that happens. In most cases, it's two arbiters and an overman, and that system works very well at present on, for WIGO valuations. Sorry, I, I was referring to the question whether not on the valuation of the improvement, which comes at WIGO, but the question as to whether an improvement should be recognised as an improvement, which comes at the period when you serve notice, and that's the, a dispute over the appropriateness of, of an, an improvement can't be referred to anyone other than the land court. I would agree with Christopher on that. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, let's yeah. move on to retirement, succession and assignation. I like Thank you very much, convener, and um, I think we're, we're coming to the real nub of some of these uh, proposals here, I think, and I'm, I, I've been trying to think of one way to amalgamate all this into one question, and I have failed miserably. Um, so I think I'm going to have to deal with this in sort of three subsections, if I may, convener. Um, uh, and I'll base the first two on, on, recommend, on specific recommendations in the review. Um, the first being that the review recommended uh, that family members to whom a tenancy could be assigned or bequeathed, and I quote, um, should be widened to include any living parent or any living descendant of a parent or spouse or civil partner of any living descendant of a parent of the tenant or of the tenant, spouse or civil partner. That's recommendation 13. And my question is really, um, do, do you think, I mean, to, to my mind, that is widening out the possibility that somebody with absolutely no connection to that holding at all could be bequeathed or assigned the, the lease. And I wonder if you, I wonder what the views of the panel are and whether they think that is fair, particularly if there is, if the landlord doesn't have any, if there is no, not necessarily the landlord, but if there is no fit or proper person test built into that, and also whether, because I think this is an important point that I'm not sure has been brought into these uh, discussions, whether the holding in question is a viable unit. I, I mean, I do think one of the reasons for uh, one of the reasons for reducing numbers of tenants over the last 50 years is that holdings have got bigger and bigger and bigger because they've had to, to be to be viable. Um, so you have less holdings to put on the market. But I I just wonder if you feel that that proposal is fair, um, given the lack of challenge that there seems to me by the person who's able to let the land. So, Christopher Nicholson, then Stuart. Um, you referred to a landlord not being able to challenge uh, a possible successor. Uh, however, our, our understanding was that the, the existing test would remain. A landlord can object on the basis of um, character, farming ability, and, and um, financial background of the successor, which he can do at the moment. So... If I was to assign my lease to a next of kin, if, if the, la the landlord has the, ab has the ability to object, if, if there is a reason that that, assign that's, that successor is not of fit character, not of fit ability to farm, and not has, does not have access to sufficient capital to farm. So I, th I think there's so good you, protection you, you, of the landlord's interest. So you believe that the, the fit and proper person test is, is, all, is built in already? I think it's built in, yeah. In which case I stand corrected. Does anybody else want to comment on that? I don't think that's what the report, the review group's recommendations are. I think I they... always assume that that was a detail that would, would remain. I, th I think that when it comes to um, succession and pro probably, con well, definitely conversion too, is, it's very important that there's a balance achieved. And... We're of the view that the proposals that the review group have come up with are not appropriately balanced. They represent a er substantial erosion of the landlord's rights. And as you'll have seen from our submission, we've taken um, uh, opinion from senior counsel. And the firm view that's come back from counsel is that these proposals represent a breach of ECHR and ultimately leave the government with the prospect of a very hef hefty circa 600 million bill of, comp of paying compensation to landlords. So I think that's pretty blunt and fundamental in terms of the Scottish land estate's position and how we see things. And what, clearly what we don't want to be doing going forward is going into any new legislation that's going to see a period of um, conflict, uh, action in courts, repeat of Salveson versus Riddle. Um, so let's see if there's a, a better way 
of going forward, and certainly with regard to succession, we've always understood that the difficulty um, uh, or the, or the particular difficulty was associated with um, uh, successors who were currently excluded under the legislation but who are, had an attachment or working with the holding. And our, our view is that we would be supportive of succession rights if the successor had um, uh, an attachment to the holding. You know, they were earning a proportion of their income from the holding. Okay, just before we come to Scott Walker, Mike Russell wants to ask us something. To, to, to challenge the assertion about um, UCHR, I mean, this is always a matter of opinion, and you have an opinion on the matter, uh, that you have no more than an opinion on the matter. But there's a different perspective you could take on this, which would be that from 1948 onwards, and the freedom to assign that was in the legislation in 1948, then the freedom to assign has been gradually eroded over that period of time, uh, since 1958, and the pendulum is beginning to swing back to a more reasonable set of arrangements in which assignation should take place in the best interests of the tenant and the landlord, providing that is going to lead to a continuing safe operation and secure operation of the farming business. Now, I think that Christopher's view on making sure that there is still a test is a good one, but I actually think the inevitability is that you will continue for that pendulum to swing towards much freer assignation. And it would be better to engage with that, which is far more what communities wish to take place, because communities very often feel pretty aggrieved when tenants can't assign in the way they wish to. It would be better to go along with that and to find a way to make it work for both sides than to bring along the big stick of ECHR and say, unless you, if you even think of doing this, uh, then it's going to cost the government a lot of money, so back off. I don't think that's a helpful contribution to the debate. What would be a helpful contribution to the debate is to find a way in which this could be made to work so that tenants felt that their, <coughs> their desire to see this business continue in, in a way that they believe is right for the business and right for their family is supported by landowners uh, by negotiation. I think it would have been irresponsible of Scottish Land Estates not to have identified this difficulty and brought it to the attention of the government and this committee. Um, there may well be some landlords that would have the view that Mike Russell has expressed, but there may well be others who have a completely different view and one where they feel that their rights are severely prejudiced and resulting in a, a loss of value and one that they wish to pursue. But tenants may also feel, if I may just press this issue with Mr Young, uh, tenants will also feel that their rights are being unfairly restricted. I could take you to a constituent of mine whose rights he believes were strongly impinged upon in terms of his wish to succeed his uncle in the farm and was unable to do so. So there are rights on both sides, and rights do not only accrue to property. Rights also exist in individuals and in communities. That's why uh, next week we're holding a, a seminar on human rights and land reform, to which you're very welcome to attend, and I hope you will attend, because there are a balance of rights to be struck here. And whilst I'm sure it is helpful for uh, Scottish land and estates to, uh, to seek council's opinion, it might also be helpful to recognise that that is only an opinion and a negotiated discussion of this might be better. Um, Scott Walker and then Dave, Dave Thompson's got a point. Yeah, when, when the TFF was up and, up and running, this was an issue that was discussed uh, within the TFF over, over, over many years. And there was a general recognition that there is a problem in families, especially when it's untimely death, that nieces and nephews didn't have a right to take over, over the tenancy. And I think there was also a, a general recognition within the industry that we needed to change the rules. Now, that's as far as it went. There was then a little bit of dispute as to how far you, you change, change, change the rules. But what we generally have here put in front of us, this idea of going back up the family tree, then down the fam fam family tree to pass, pass on the tenancy, uh, to us seems broadly, broadly sensible. I think <clears throat> you still have to keep uh, certain restrictions in place to make sure that the people who do take on that tenancy, you know, do they have the where for all to pay the rent? Do they have the knowledge to actually do the far farming enterprise? And certainly through our discussions with the review group, 
we'd always believed that those sort of protections would, would remain there. Because I think, again, if you look at, say, the wider public interest as well as the, the interest of the individual business, you want whoever can actually take on that tenancy to be able to farm that tenancy properly and be to, able to contribute to, to ag agricultural, agricultural holdings. So it was being put forward here by the review group. Again, to us, seems broad, broadly sensible. The, the issues about lawyers and what's possible in lawyers, we would leave that to, to others to, to determine what, what may or may not be possible in those aspects. Um, Dave Thompson. Thank you, convener. Uh, I'm struggling to understand um, what Stuart Young is really saying, because if a landowner has a good tenant at the moment and they're complying with all the sort of conditions and so on that Scott Walker mentioned, you know, in, in terms of running a farm, and they want to assign it to another good tenant that's going to run it really well with all the safeguards and so on, what detriment is there to the landowner in that case? Because they're just getting a new good tenant in place of an old good tenant. The only thing that comes to my mind is there's been a steady decline in tenanted farms. Opposing the proposal is going to lead to a continuing steady decline in tenanted farms. Now, if that's the intention, then you should be open about it. If it's not, explain to me what the difference is between an existing good tenant and a new good tenant. I think that um, what, what we envisage is that um, without the, the, the widening of accession, succession and conversion, what would happen in a normal course of events where there are no successes is that tenancies would come back to landlords. And mm -hmm. with the right climate and environment, landlords would then relet these holdings. They may well, take, may well want to sell it because they have the, the need to ra raise funds for a particular purpose. They, may, they may, may wish to plant it. They may wish to change the land use or they may wish to relet it. And I think that having that range of options is something that has a value to the landlord, and it's that loss in value that's been, that I'm highlighting in relation to uh, the proposals as they, as they stand. Mm -hmm. So it's not necessarily that they, just, they want to see the, the continued pe perpetuation of that tenancy ad finitum. Yeah, maybe I can just come back quickly, convener. Um, well, it strikes me, then, that you're striking right at the heart of the purpose of having secure tenancies in that case. You're really saying that, that landowners will have their own views as to how they want to use that tenanted land, and if they can get an opportunity to get rid of a secure tenant because they're retiring and there's nobody they can assign it to, then that's what a landlord would do. So you're really, I suppose, suggesting that landlords would indeed prefer that legislation to be swept away totally so they have the freedom to be able to do what they want with what they see as their land. I don't, th I, I don't think that's what I've, I've, I've suggested, that, that um, the uh, uh, existing succession rights are swept away. I've supported, um, uh, indicated Scottish land as its support for a widening of succession rights where there's um, uh, hardship. I just think that it's... Um, uh, of wider benefit if there is an opportunity arising where a landlord can reorganise his, his affairs. I think that the, within the report, the review group recognised that 1991 Act tenancies are perhaps not fit for purpose in the longer term. And I think your public policy has already determined that new tenancies going forward and has, and has done since 2003 should be fixed duration tenancies. Uh, right. Just We've got one more point to make here from Christopher Nicholson. We must come back to Alec Ferguson. Uh, to Just two conclude. quick points. I was um, genuinely surprised by the opposition from landlords to the widening of family succession, um, par partly because in England, the DEFRA Future of Farming report published in 2013 rec made the same recommendation for English tenancies, widening of family succession and removal of their equivalent of the viable unit test. And I never noticed in the press um, opposition from English landlords to that recommendation. And, and secondly, just to reinforce the po point David Thompson made, um, we, we, see secure, we, we see that there is a strong public interest argument in taking every 
achievable measure to preserve the area of land under security of tenure. Security of tenure was introduced in 1948 and has largely shaped the, the nature of Scottish farming in the intervening years. It's the one measure that has allowed Scottish farming to flourish, it's allowed tenants to make investments under security of tenure, and it's allowed a lot of tenants to move on to the next stage and actually buy their, buy their farms. And we have limited history now, 20 years in England of FBTs, short-term leases, um, the story of the limited partnership tenancies in Scotland over the last 30 years. And in those cases, a lot of those tenancies struggle to, um, short-term tenancies struggle to keep even the land in good heart, never mind provide continuing investment into the holdings. So I do not see what is wrong with secured tenancies going forward. And I think without security of tenure being an option for new blood coming in to the industry, I don't see how new, new blood comes in and establishes successful long-term businesses. Okay, uh, Sarah Boyack, perhaps. Quite a quick question, just listening to the discussion as it's going on. I mean, I think all of us would accept that family structures have changed. If we went back in my own family one or two generations, um, there were six or seven um, brothers and sisters um, it's pretty normal for people to have one or two kids now. So I think that the nature of families is changing. And is that not an issue in terms of um, somebody who is planning to retire or to want to hand on that w what is being suggested there by Stuart Young is just, it, it just immediately stops because there's not been um, a son or a daughter or somebody in the very close family who wants to be um, a tenant farmer and that, you know, all the time that somebody might have spent up in their career just disappears and there's no value left to that family and no influence as well. Well, Ken Bolt, and if anyone wants to come back very briefly, we've, we're making some progress, but we've got an awful lot more to do before the we The RICS uh, doesn't support the extension of assignation. Um, I think one of the, the broader problems we have is farms becoming available for new entrants, we'll get on to discuss that. Um, because the 91 Act tenancies keep on rolling on. And I think that what the RICS sees is that anything that doesn't allow them to come back onto the market, we have, we have something like 80% of the let agricultural land of 1.2 million uh, hectares uh, is locked in to 91 Act tenancies. Uh, I've had uh, in the last probably 10 years, three of them, uh, three, three 91 Act tenancies have come up and they've all been re-let to farming families um, because that's what the landlords wanted to do. So I think by extending the, uh, the breadth of ASIG, uh, assignees, it just means that there will be less farms coming up and I think we need slightly more radical thinking if we're going to try and unlock land, which the government has said that is what it wants to do. Well, I guess that's up to us to look at as we go forward. But, uh, you know, Alec Fer Ferguson has been waiting for a long while to come back on his points. Thank you, convener. It's an it's a interesting and very relevant discussion. And, and I have to say, you know, my question was whether this is fair. And I say that because I quite agree with Mike Russell that there needs to be a balance in all of this. If we are, we've all talked about trust and confidence. If that is to be put back into this sector, then everything we do needs to be fair at the end of the day. But if I could move on to the, to the uh, second recommendation that, that, that sort of comes under this heading which is that a 91 Act tenants should be able to convert their tenancy into a new LDT with a minimum of 35 years, um, which could then be assigned on the open market. And I, I just want to spend a little bit of time on that particular topic because some people have said to me, people, um, landowners who, who are in the business of letting land, that they, are, that they can understand where this is coming from, but they believe that 34, 35 years is too long. It's a minimum of 35 years, not 35 years, a minimum of 35 years. Um, and it's been put to me that this would be much more acceptable and, and would receive much a greater degree of buy-in from the landowning sector, if I can call it that, if it was reduced to maybe 20, 25 years. And uh, again, I just would like everybody's views on, on that. It seems to be a principle that people are not against uh, in, in general, but there, there is a worry about this, the, the length of the, the, the LDT that's proposed. 
Christopher Nicholson has already stated his case very clearly. Yeah, I'm, I'm not. Th that's fine. I'm just, so just so saying. So that's, know that's one you know of. Uh, Scott Walker. Um, we, we find this the most contentious issue out of the, the whole uh, uh, paper that's, that's been put, put, for, put forward. And we've got very strong views being expressed to us by some of our tenants within NFU Scotland and very strong views being expressed to, to us by our landowner members in, in NFU Scotland. And I find it quite interesting sort of sitting in between on one side, I've, I've got SLE on one side of me and one side, I've got Chris Nicholson, which sometimes feels the same within NFUS, that you've got these, these different you know, bodies, bodies competing against, against one, one another. What, what I go back to is the, the reason why this change was, was talked about in, in, in the first place. And for, for NFU Scotland, we were looking at the situation of you have some tenancy with a secure tenancy who ha had no one to assign that secure tenancy to. Um, you know, the rules of succession limited who, who they could assign it to. Now, what has been done by the Scottish Government would tend to show that maybe up to 70% of secure tenants do have somebody who would be able to succeed their, their tenancy. So it leaves a group there who doesn't. If we widen the rules of succession uh, further, as has been proposed, proposed there, again, that will give another option of people where they can pass on, on the secure tenancy. But for those who are left with no one to pass on the secure tenancy to, what you have the situation is that financially for those individuals, it's generally better for them to stay in the holding as long as possible, which we would suggest isn't good for the individual, and it's not actually good for the land itself. It's being you know, underused, under, underutilised. So for us, we, we came up with this idea of you know, changing assignation of, of, this, of the secure, secure tenancy, because it would give some value back to the tenant, encourage him to move on, and it would, would hopefully also ensure that the land is utilised more. So that, that's a principle in terms of where NFU Scotland comes from. Speaking to, to all sides in the argument, I think, as, as Alex says, I think there is, a, there is a broad consensus that the idea of conversion of, of a secure tenancy to some fixed term is sensible. And what we're really debating then is the length of that fixed term, what that fixed term should, should be. And I don't think you will come to a full consensus within the industry as to what that fixed term should, should be. For NFUS originally, we talked about that fixed term being 25 years. And we also talked about that assignation being to a new entrant specifically, you know, some sort of vehicle to give them a route into, route into the industry. Now, the review group, what they've come up with is something slightly different. You know, they sort of see it being wider. So it's not just for a new entrant. Anyone could be assigned that secure tenancy. And in terms of, instead of 25 years, the review group is suggesting 30, 35, 35, 35 years. I think seeing that, you know, we could accept that. We could go, go along, along with it. Um, as I say, we had been looking originally, though, for, for that to be some other route for new entrants or somebody getting, getting started, started into, into the industry. Do you think for one minute that uh, the large submission that you made at the last minute to us um, reflects the views of tenants in the NFU? Or is it uh, the kind of uh, dichotomy that you've explained to us mm. is there and visible? in the NFU's approach because, you know, it's a very large paper that we got at the last minute. It didn't help us to do any mm. analysis of it. And I have to say, it doesn't sound to me as though the tenants in the NFU had very much say in it. I, I think the, the problem was, say, for us in the papers that we submitted to, to the group is that we see this all as a continuation of the process. So we're not coming to this just new, new, new today. So we'd, we'd done a very, very detailed response into that Holdings Review Group. And I've got to say, most of what we've actually suggested has been shown in the Ag Holdings, Holdings Review Group. And what we should have probably made clear to, to all the committee members was that what we've suggested beforehand, we should have shared all that with you, and we should have shared with you the fact that you know, virtually everything that's in this Review Group document is you know, policy of, uh, of NFU Scotland. So that should have been explained. 
you know, what I've tried to explain just now is exactly, you know, the, I, I'd say NFU Scotland is, in essence, just a, a smaller profile of the industry as a whole. And the tensions that exist with NFU Scotland just now on this issue of assignation reflects the tensions that exist in the in, in this industry as, as a whole. As I say, where, where there is consensus is I think people do see that this flexibility will provide a mechanism for tenants to be able to move out the land. It will provide a mechanism to ensure that that land's more utilised in, in the future. And then we're real f therefore getting down to what's reasonable in terms of that length, 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 of, length of term and whether or not there should be any other restrictions placed on it as to who should actually be able to take over that, that assignation. As I say, originally, we suggested it should be uh, limited to just new entrants coming into the industry, but recognising that's not come out of the review group, I suppose we are, we are willing to put, put that one to, to the side. I think we're going to have to move on. I think we've had a, a demarche on the e EC. But I'm Point. sorry, we've got a really good point. I well, I'm to sure make. that's true. I, I, I think well, we have we have practical suggestion to the panel. Yes, but a practical suggestion, um, which Dave, is which is quite simply. Point. I, I, I was going to do, discuss the ECHR implications, but we've we've been there. Um, the the, the in order to, w w there is an issue, I think, in, in, in landlords seeing the ability to um, convert to a, a minimum 35-year LDT, um, which can then be assigned on the open market, as being seen as a way of preventing them being able to take land that they own back in hand. Um, and I think that is an issue that I I is sort of up there. Would there be any, in the panel's view, is there any future just as a tenant has a, a preemptive right to buy if a, a, a farm is put onto the market, in a landlord or landowner having a preemptive right to take on an assignation that is put on the open market, is there any future in going down that route? Right, Stuart Young and then to Christopher Nicholson briefly. V very quickly, which is better than not having it. Um, the, the, the original... One of the original recommendations in the interim report of the review group was the option of assignation of a secure tenancy to continue as a secure tenancy, but with a landlord preemptive right. Oh, right. And I think the landlord preemptive right was in there to ensure compliance with ECHR. And the feeling was that in the case of the conversion to an LDT, it possibly wasn't required to be ECHR compliant to include a landlord's preemptive right. And... In, from some er areas, there was a concern that landlords would simply exercise the preemptive right and, and take every, everything back in hand. I, I don't believe that would be the case. Mm. And, and going forward, we, we believe that, uh, uh, that a, a policy that would be in the public interest and, and fair would be for the original proposal to be put back in, which allows open assignation of secure tenancies but with a landlord's preemptive right to protect the landlord's interest. Thank you very much for that. Thank you, convener. Okay, right, Dave. Thank you. Point. Nicely from what Christopher has said, convener, and thank you for uh, letting me get in here. It, it, it's, if what Christopher was suggesting in terms of um, assignations, as the SDFA would like to see, being extended to non-family members, that would deal with Ken Bolt's point about new entrants, because if you broaden it, you're actually opening it up to new entrants. So I don't really understand the Rick's point there. It would also mean there would be less appetite for people to convert to secure LDTs. So would, would that not actually resolve the problem, provided you've got all the safeguards and you get a good tenant in there? Soon. Well, I hope quite soon. <laughs> uh, I have quite great. Well, Ken Bolt's name was mentioned there. Pass. Okay. <laughs> Thank you for that. Right, I'll take that as acceptance of the point. <laughs> <laughs> well, who knows? Uh, the role of the right to buy. So, in this case, we've got. Uh, am I correct? Yes, I think I am. Claudia Beamish. Um, 
I'd like to seek the panel's views on um, three questions in this, in this section of, of our deliberations this morning. And I think um, it might be helpful if I could outline those three and then get any responses to different aspects that um, panel members want to comment on. Um, so in terms of the first question is comments on the removal of the requirement to register. Um, the second is the proposal for a tenant to be able to apply to the land court to force the sale where the landlord is failing to meet their obligations. And the last point at this stage um, for response, please, is the right for ministers to intervene to address barriers to local sustainable development and how that might apply in the farming context. So I don't know who would like to proceed to the convener. Okay, Ken Bolt. Yeah. The RICS think that um, this, the registration process is straightforward at the moment. Um, if there are, there are any issues on boundaries and so on, they're dealt with at or near the time of the registration, and uh, it's a straightforward process. So I think that um, it thinks that um, it's unnecessary to change the existing arrangements. That would be for registration. Society on that, because I think that in written evidence you'd expressed a view um, on the, the need to, re to register. Yes. I mean, uh, may I say, first of all, that um, the, 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 the Law Society's role here is to look for good law or to mm -hmm. avoid bad law, and we're not, by our constitution, um, going to apply any thought or comment on policy. Right. Um, but it, 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 it seems to us that um, there is no reason why there couldn't be an open, automatic uh, right to buy, uh, and avoiding the um, often, but probably sporadic, nevertheless, inclination for some people to not sub subtenants not to to, to um, seek to register an interest because they might sour the relationship with the landlord thank you uh, so Christopher. wanted to comment there and then scott walker um on the on the first point the, the need to register requirement current requirement to register we, we don't see any reason to register um <coughs> And it's, there are many tenants who have been deterred from registering by, by their, their landlords or agents. The result is that only about a sixth of tenants in Scotland have registered, or a fifth of tenants. Um, so we, we welcome this proposal. It's, it's, it's practical and common sense. Walker? Yeah. Um, I think it's, it's in the interest of all tenants to register. Um, I don't think they should be the, have the process of physically having to register. Their proposal here seems com common sense. And, you know, it's, it's only when the land's been sold then the tenant would get first, first right, first refusal. So that seems a sen sensible way. In, in, in terms of uh, um, the land court and ministers to, to force, force, a, force a sale, what we've always said is that you've got to spell out clearly what the obligations are. Uh, for, for, for the parties. Uh, we see this as a role again for the Commissioner to be, to be in, involved in. So I'm sure in most situations people will adhere to their obligations and responsibilities. Where they're not adhering to it, then we believe that the Commissioner should intervene, draw to the attention of where those obligations aren't being met, set out a plan and a time scale for you know, the landlord to have the opportunity to put, put things, things right. And only if there's, you know, refusal and, you know, clear negligence and clear um, not sticking to that plan, then as a matter of last resort, 
then there could be an enforced sale put, put, in, put in place. So we see that as a sanction that would be ha helpful. It's a sanction of last resort and also a sanction that hopefully would never actually have to be, to be used because the threat of it will be enough to ensure that the obligations are delivered. That only answers really the second part, um, Scott, in a sense, because the, the third part is um, the right of ministers to intervene to address barriers to local sustainable development, yeah. rather than the landlord not meeting the obligation, which is, which is a land court issue. Yeah. So, so if on, you have any comment on that, that would be helpful. Yeah, so on, on the third part, in, in some ways I, I would see that exactly the same as the likes of the Competition Markets Authority. So you know, where, where there's um, any restrictions in place that are detrimental to the market and aren't fulfilling economic growth, growth perspectives, then it's quite right that government should in intervene. You know, currently, government has powers through local authorities for compulsory purchase through for, for cer mm -hmm. certain measures. Mm -hmm. And again, we'd have to see how, once this is uh, drawn up in, in the bill, but that sort of um, uh, scenario that where the market is failing, you know, where economic growth is being hindered, then the government and you know the, the authority of the government should be there to do something about it. Sustainable development being the phrase rather than yeah. economic growth, just to be quite accurate about that. Well, yeah, I, I suppose when we say sustainable development, we recognise it crosses a lot of different elements, right. but okay. we would go back to agricultural production right. being, being the key aspect there. Stuart Young. De dealing with the first point, uh, the removal of the requirement to register in relation to the preemptive right to buy. Uh, I think there will be a degree of consensus amongst the stakeholders on that particular point, although the, the principal concern for Scottish land and estates um, membership is what the trigger points are and how they actually are defined, and that's a level of detail to which the um, uh, review group have not gone into. So I think we really need to understand that and would be clearly willing to engage as that is, in, is explored further. The um, second uh, element, which is the uh, power of forced sale and uh, ability to apply to the, the land co court, um, I think if the process is fair and appropriate, with appropriate checks and balances, then um, the reality is that few landlords would um, ever be forced to sell, and uh, anybody, but arguably anybody put themselves in that position would... Um, uh, be facing the, the, the consequences. So it's not a, an issue that Scottish land estates have great concern over. Um, and thirdly, the power of the um, Minister to intervene, um, perhaps not surprisingly, it's a suggestion that we've got sort of a fundamental difficulty with in principle, but it's a recommendation that's not... When we're, haven't any seen the detail of a proposal, not fully developed, and uh, again, the, re the review group suggests it's something for further consideration. Well, we'd be delighted to consider it further when there's something to consider. We would have uh, liked to have been able to consider in detail your thoughts, but once again, we received your remarks very late in the day, and uh, it's kind of difficult for us to go into great detail on that. Mike Russell? Yeah, on this um, issue of, of, of uh, in ministerial intervention, I think there is with respect to Mr Young, I think there is some detail in this. And the parallel is very much in terms of uh, the communities and the role of communities that we talked on about earlier. W agricultural uh, tenancies are a very important part of some communities, and particularly smaller communities, for example, in my constituency of island communities, where the difficulty exists, where the sustainable development, the community, the future of the community is put at risk by landlords who are not fulfilling their obligations and whose actions are leading to widespread depopulation, uh, the, the, the loss of farms, then there is a tangible and clear impact upon a community. A community can uh, suffer depopulation, uh, can in, it, its whole focus moves away from the rural, and none of us wish to see that. So I think the parallel here is with the land other land reform actions where people can take actions in a community to ensure that farms uh, and, and that the nature of that community continues. And the empowering here is for the individual tenants to play a role in so doing. Now, I think as that detailed development develops, it will say two things. One is it will make it clear why this should sit within, uh, this whole process should sit within the land reform legislation uh, because it is part of land reform. And secondly, it will require us all 
to look at the balance between individual rights under ECHR and wider community rights and to make sure the two are both given uh, uh, fair treatment. Uh, so I think there is detail in this and I think that is what is being proposed and I hope that all the organisations will treat this very seriously because there are places where communities have been uh, very severely damaged by the actions of landlords. Stuart Young. Um, Mike Russell referred to situations where um, landlords are not fulfilling their obligations. M my view is that the power of forced sale would deal with that particular problem. It may, and, but the, the, the interest of the community must also be borne in mind. You know, I can see that forced sale might well be an individual reaction to it. But where there are a range of tenancies within uh, an estate, uh, all of which are creating this problem, and the attitude of the estate is creating this problem, then there needs to be a change. I mean, I'm, I've expressed my view on this committee before. I think, you know, large estates are not actually, um, uh, although they're one of the, the issues in land reform, they're not the only one. You know, local authorities are a big one in terms of local authority. But there are specific circumstances in places in Scotland where the policy of estates has led to the depopulation of areas. I think, you know, I've seen evidence on this presented by a range of bodies. And I think that is the issue that's attempting to be tackled here by ministerial intervention. So it is clear, well-defined and proportionate in terms of putting the interests of the communities alongside the interests of individuals. Scott Walker. Uh, sorry, just in danger of, well, I'm in danger of straying off slight, slightly here in, in response to, to Michael, Michael Russell's, Russell's point there. I think when, when we look at land reform and community uh, rights to buy and community in, in involvement, uh, we've, we've had quite extensive consultation with, with our members across, across the country. And for us, this issue goes beyond just the issue of estates, uh, impacts on any, any landowner of, of any, any, any size. And I know there is a lot of concern within the farm, farming community as to what that impact could be on an individual, individual holdings, because while people want to be supportive of local, local development, depending on your farm, depending on what piece of land maybe local development wants to take place on, that could have quite significant impacts upon the viability of those individual bus businesses. So they'd, they'd be sort of the general issues we'd bring up in the context of that wider discussion. I have a conversation with individual farmers, and I'm doing so in my own area, uh, because I don't think the, the, the absolutely overwhelming majority of individual farmers have any reason to fear this at all. Indeed, uh, you know, I think there's an advantage for, for them in making sure that their role in the community is better defined. So I don't think that, that uh, difficulty and danger exists. I think it should be addressed community by community and place by place. And it should, and, um, you know, I play my role in that. But it is important to see this in the context of empowering and enabling communities uh, rather than shutting them out. Thank you, um, could I turn our minds to comments, please, on whether the panel believe that uh, the review group came to the right conclusion on absolute right to buy. And I just give you one brief quote, which is um, from paragraph 208 of the, rec of the report, which says that the concept of absolute right to buy, though its potential impact, sorry, through its potential impact on the supply of tenanted land and on the wider confidence of investors in rural Scotland, is one that the review group believes is not and would not be helpful to seeking to further the Scottish Government's vision on tenant, uh, on tenant farming. I would just like any comments on that, um, either specifically in that context or in the wider context of land reform. Chris Dickelson, yeah. Um, our main criticism of, of um, the conclusions of the review group on, on right to buy is that they appear to have failed to see the, the benefits to investment that right to buy brings. And it goes back to the discussion we, we've had, had before. When, when a tenant buys his farm, he's only buying the bit that he hasn't already paid for. He's, not having to, he's only having to pay for the bit he's not already paid for. He's not having to pay for his improvements. But as soon as he's bought the farm, all those improvements become extra collateral that he can use to access finance. And, and we see it... In all over Scotland, where, where tenants do buy their farm, there's incredible growth in their businesses in the following decades in, in general. Now, um, when the review group were going around 
meetings in the in the spring and 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 the autumn, um, they always put forward the alternative of open assignation of a secure tenancies as the alternative to a right to buy, and that the open assignation of secure tenancies would allow the investment to take place that, that you get under a right to buy, and therefore there was little public interest argument for a right to buy. But now they've, they've removed the open assignation option from their final report, and that is the single, most, the single biggest disappointment in this review to, to our, our members. And suddenly you're back to the situation where people are m making an argument for a right to buy again. And if, if, if we are to remove um, the, the, uh, the, the, the ability to buy a farm is a natural aspiration for a lot of tenants. Um, I know there are a lot of problems with enacting such a, a, a measure which may, may simply not be possible. But the calls for the right to buy are a symptom of what's wrong with the, with the legislation and the sector. And most tenants fail to see how those calls will go away without um, addressing the, the gaps that are left in the review by the removal of open assignation. So this discussion is about, uh, you know, probing further before we... I suggest what we think uh, the minister should do about it. So, you know, w w this is the next step, in a sense. Stuart Young? Uh, we would um, agree with the conclusions that the, were arrived at in paragraph 208, 208 of the report. And I'd just also like to highlight that there's a consistency in that um, position with that taken by the Land Reform Review Group in relation to the absolute right to buy. So we've had two separate pieces of work coming to the same conclusion. Yep. Um, I'd agree with uh, the comment that, that Chris said about, you know, when we talk about ab absolute right to buy, it's a symptom of what's wrong in, in the sector. And it's a reflection that for some individuals in, in the sector, they feel that relationships are so broken, so damaged, that that's their only recourse of, of action. We've had uh, a lot of debate on this issue within NFU Scotland over, over many years. And... You know, it's probably the most contentious issue um, uh, in all these discussions. And it probably goes part down to this whole element that was talked about earlier about trust and confidence going for forward in, in, in the future. So for a lot of people that wish to let out land and people who wish to let out land on a long-term basis, the discussion about absolute right to buy have really clouded their sentiment in, in doing those types of activities and for many of our tenants they feel that discussions about absolute right to buy is stopping the letting uh, of land function properly within Scotland at, at the same time. Um, at the same time as that however you know we do recognise that there are some tenants within NFU Scotland who firmly believe that the only solution to all of this is actually you know coming forward with an absolute right, right to buy and everything else that's been talked about is irrelevant, and that's the solution to, to all of it. Our view is that when you th weigh everything, everything up, that the recommendation and the conclusion that's come out in this report, that absolute right to buy wouldn't deliver what we want, which is in terms of you know, fair tenancy agreements for existing tenants, and also having the, the confidence in the sector for letting land in the future. I think to rule out absolute right to buy is the correct, correct thing to do. We don't, we're not going to be able to talk about this any longer at the moment. No doubt we will in future. We've had a variety of views on it. And you mentioned new letting vehicles for the 21st century. Alec Ferguson, back to you. Come back to the, the whole core of, of this, which is to try to restore uh, an element of confidence and trust in, in between between landlord and tenant, basically, and a, a trust in the system so that those who have land to let are more willing to let it than they currently appear to be. And that seems to me to be the, the very core of the reinvigorated tenancy sector that I'm quite sure everybody around this table wishes to see. Um, so the, there are proposals for new types of tenancy, 
Um, we have an intriguing possibility of a, of a full repairing LDT, again over 35 years, and if I have a, an issue with that, it's only the length of, of that proposal. Um, and we have various other types of, of lease proposed, but bef perhaps before, one of the things that was rejected was, was freedom of contract, as, which was already brought up. It seems to, um, it, it, it operates down south, how well or successfully, that may be open to question, but it does seem to have restored a degree of confidence in the system because people are letting land uh, more than they were before um, that sort of system came into being. So do you, do you think, do you think the, the review panel was right to rule out effectively uh, freedom of contract? But, but, but my main question at this stage is really, do you think that the proposals that have been put forward are on the types of letting vehicles um, are enough to restore the confidence that's needed with those who have land to let to do so? Okay, Scott Walker, briefly, please. Um, I, I think in terms of restoring confidence, it's about this entire package, and it's how this entire package is to, to be delivered. So there's not one specific element of it. It's looking at everything in, in the whole. So I, w I would say, say that first. Uh, with regards to the 35-year um, uh, new, new suggestion uh, that's been put forward, that, that seems sensible. You know, it seems an opportunity that... There are uh, is land holdings out there that do need investment. Uh, the landlord's not in a position to, to make that investment to bring up to scratch. And for somebody to be able to take on that land with a minimum term of 35 years, that seems sensible and that it could work for, for both parties. So we think that's an interesting development and one we'd like to see worked up in, in more, more detail. Um, I think when you look just now, uh, general SLDTs and LDTs, there's nothing fundamentally wrong with the letting vehicles that we, we current, currently have. And again, that's a message that I sort of take from what comes, comes out of, of this report. The whole issue is about confidence, and the whole issue really comes to about you know, people being confident to let on a long-term basis, and tenants feeling confident that when they come to the end of their term, that they're going to get another term thereafter. And for both parties, whether it's a landlord or, or tenant, um, where things are working, it's in the interest of both parties to continue working together and to, to take, take on. Because any time you bring somebody new in, there's uncertainty, there's change. So what we need to do is, is get to a situation where um, it encourages people to, to let on a long-term basis and continue to let on, on a long, long-term base, basis. Uh, there's two things just very briefly I'd, I, I would bring in is I have a little bit of concern with the current arrangements being proposed here of how you actually deal with uh, you know some crop inlets you know how they would adequately be be covered because the what I read certainly here is you either go for very very short term on a year by year basis which I don't think is satisfactory for for any party in terms of looking forward to the future or you've got to do a minimum of 10 years, which for some cropping practices just doesn't fit in with the, with the practices out there. And secondly, on a slightly diff, different, different situation, um, it's been mentioned already today that you have uh, limited partnerships, which largely had worked for most people for a long period, period of time. But we've got to the situation now where limit partnerships have either come to an end or will be coming to an end, end short, shortly. And what you've got is a, is a situation of tacit relocation each and, each and every year, where they're tending to be rolled on on a yearly basis. But that's not particularly good for either, either party again, because while they're continuing to be rolled on, no one knows how long they're going to be rolled on. And I think it's, it's the wish of, of the industry. And I know this discussion started very, very early stages between SLE, STFA, and NFUS, is to see, you know, could we encourage those individuals that are in those situations to sit down and see if they can come to any sort of sensible working arrangements that suit both parties, that would encourage uh, a longer term uh, security to be, be put in place for those individuals. Martin and then uh, Stuart Young. Thank you. Um, our, our concern is a practical one over an over, uh, uh, item that Scott has just touched on, is on the, on the gap between the one and the ten years, and particularly for some areas of cropping land, and, and, and just the requirement 
I think all that will do if, we, if that is brought in at the moment is, is probably um, allow people to look outside the legislation for contract farming agreements or, or share farming agreements or, or alternative vehicles. Um, so it's a, it's a, it's a real, it would be a real problem for the industry, I think, uh, the gap in between one and ten years. Stuart Young. I'm, I'm going to concur with much of what uh, Scott has said and, and, al and also Martin, so be, be therefore reasonably brief. But I think it's important for me to say that Scottish Land Estates view some of the proposals that the review group have come up with very positively by introducing the degree of flexibility in rela relation to the new LDT, although I think the 35-year term for a repairing lease is something that would r rather leave the parties to be able to agree. Um, and, and just... To, to reiterate the difficulty of not having something to fill the gap between one and um, uh, ten years. I can think of many examples that I've com come across in my working life where people want to let particularly range ranges of buildings. I don't have any cattle, but I've got buildings. My neighbour has ca cattle. He'd like to use my buildings. How, how do I do it? Well, that's contract farming, isn't it? Um, Ken Bolt. I would just say the RICS would echo what everyone else has said, the, the problem of only having two options, or the, the one year or the 10 year or the 35 year. I just don't think there's enough freedom there uh, for the parties. Uh, they've got these fixed vehicles they can use and they will, uh, as Martin said, look outside the box at other arrangements to get round. So I don't think they're particularly helpful. Yes. Very briefly get Chris Nicholson's yep. views on that last comment. That we, that we need more options in there. Okay. Christopher. Um, we're, we're, we're pleased that the review group re rejected freedom of contract for the obvious reasons um, of the land ownership structure in the, in the tenanted sector. Um, we don't see a lot wrong with the existing uh, sh um, new style leases we have at the moment, SLDTs and LDTs. Um, LDTs were modified in 2012 to reduce landlords' obligations on fixed equipment. So we don't really see where the, uh, why they shouldn't be fit for purpose going forward. But we should be realistic about what they will be used for. They will be useful as bolt-on lettings to existing businesses. They're, it's highly unlikely that they will provide a um, suitable base for new entrants to build a secure business going, going forward. And we only have to look at where a lot of limited partnership tenants are at the moment who were yesterday's new entrants. Thompson, very briefly on this point, we must yes, convene a... I think the discussion that we've just had just highlights uh, one of the, the problems and difficulties. That there are all sorts of issues around this that we could argue away for months, if not years, and I think it highlights the point that the STFA have made that open assignation deals with the problem very simply and very effectively. And as soon as you move into the sort of SDLTs and everything we're talking about here, you get into all sorts of debates about that, whereas open assignation gives freedom to everyone. And I'm very much uh, of a mind that I like to keep things simple, and this is only really going to complicate matters and involve... Ricks and lawyers and everyone else even more in the future. And I think we need to bear that in mind. It's maybe more a comment than a question, convener. Well, if that's the case, it's Alec Ferguson is going to make a comment as well. Uh, I'm very tempted to make quite a long comment, convener, but I think it probably so, wouldn't look very good in the official report. Um, I, I, I think Mr. Thompson's got his message, his wires slightly crossed on that particular issue. But I, I, what has struck me out of this, just in winding up, is there's actually, I think, a great deal of agreement here um, and, and I would just like to think that with a little bit of give and take either way as this thing goes forward, we, we could end up uh, actually all in agreement on this issue, which could only be to everybody's benefit. Yeah, yeah. It'd be wonderful. Um, uh, new entrants and reducing barriers to entry. Into Angus MacDonald. Well, yeah. um, the, the review identified the need for more starter farms to be available, uh, and it also found that... Um, some older tenants would be willing to provide an informal apprenticeship to a new entrant if they were able to assign the, the tenancy to them. So I'd be interested to know what the, the panel's views are on, on uh, the, the review's proposals on encouraging new entrants, uh, and do you agree that there's a need for a, a phased apprenticeship to a tenancy? Yeah. 
Christopher Nicholson and then Scott Walker. Um, S S Scottish Government are, are making progress in the creation of starter units on Forestry Commission land. Maybe there's potential in the future um, in terms of Crown Estate land. Um, we're well, well behind England, who has um, 3,000 3, um, starter units with um, county council holdings uh, and other landlords such as um, the, the Na National Trust um, farms. The, the real problem is where the new entrants go after that first rung on the, on the ladder. If those um, starter farms are for a five or ten year period, they build up some capital and the difficulty for Scotland and also for England is where those new entrants go for the next stage in, the, in their career. And, and this is where we see the, the benefits of open assignation because that would allow a, a complete rung in the ladder to, for people to enter into the tenanted sector, upsize, downsize. It would give opportunity for, um, say, tenants who are approaching the retirement but don't want to retire completely to, say, downsize to a smaller holding and someone younger move into a, a bigger holding. It, prov it would give um, uh, a level of flexibility that would bring hu huge benefits to the sector and go a long way towards um, getting new blood into the, into the sector and uh, affording them the second stage, which is, which is um, a secure base to develop a long-term business. So, Scott Walker, yeah. to add to that? Yeah. Um, ev everyone in the industry agrees they want to do more to get uh, new blood into industry and help, it, help them de develop. So, um, I agree with everything that Chris, Christopher says about you know forestry units, Crown Estate land, other land that could be looked at as, as starter units in development. The addition to that, I, I would add, is it goes again about the culture of letting land in, in, in Scotland. So the more land we can make available to be rented out, then that will help people get into the industry to get some land and it also help people develop their, their business. So it's important that we take the opportunity under what, what we're talking about just now to make sure that the bill's correct and that it encourages people to, to let out land. I think we was also there's there's a role in in the tax environment as well. You know, what tweaks could be made in the tax environment to encourage um, you know give a leg up to encourage the letting of, of land to a new entrant compared to somebody's already existing in farming, because somebody's already in existing in farming will, will usually have that financial advantage to increase the size of their holding rather than somebody else get, get in. And we've also been slow in the industry to take up our share farming agreements and various other agreements that allow somebody to start off in the industry, uh, build up their capital and slowly you know, develop. I uh, was at a recent SUS conference where there was a couple very good examples given from young individuals who have share farming agreements in, in Scotland. There were particularly one on the dairy side where um, it's, it's a woman who's taken over the dairy, dairy business. She's slowly working hand in hand with the farmer, building up her uh, number of cows in his herd and very much working, working together. As she said, it, said, it very comes, much comes down to personal relationships that putting the two individuals together and making sure that they can work work things through and I think as an industry we probably don't know do enough to highlight these good good examples and we need to shine light on those good examples and make people aware of them and how they can make those situations work wherever possible thank you um, without straying into the issue about tax just now which we can come back to at another point um, I want to just sort of see a wrap up uh, to this at the moment and I think Sarah Boyack was going to kick off the final sort of question that we've got on this number 11 if you wish. Yes definitely um, it's really just to say where do we go next in terms of the legislation um, there's different views out there um, as to whether we should have a, a new piece of agricultural holdings legislation or whether it should be slotted in as a um, a section in the Land Reform Act and I think NFUS said that you were very much against that because you thought it would leave the legislation indelibly tainted, which I thought was pretty strong wording. Um, so really keen for a view across the panel as to what do you think? You know, it's quite a while since we last had agricultural holdings legislation. 
Cabinet Secretary has seen it as a major priority because I've led the review group and it's really what happens next. You know, the first question was about the tenant um, farmer commissioner. Um, to what extent do you think there's an urgent need for legislation and what do you think the best legislative vehicle is? Stuart, yeah. I think that uh, Scott's already talked about the importance of the package and the, its ability to deliver confidence. So, so our, our position on this very much is that there should be a standalone dedicated agricultural holdings bill that delivers a package. And that this should be delivered in the current parliamentary term. So it's not something we're waiting for. So important things such as Tenant Farming Commissioner that you referred to are delivered sooner rather than later. Okay. Reform Act. Well, I think that the, the, the understanding I, I have from dialogue that um, Scottish Land and State officials have had with um, civil servants is that they'll not get it all in a land reform bill. It, they'll not get it all in the whole package within a bill. If they can, if they could deliver it within a bill, that would be better. But I do also agree to a certain extent. I'm, I'm not sure if I use the same language as as Scott, but I think that it deserves, agricultural law is a complicated area, deserves its own dedicated bill. Okay. Uh, Mike Russell. Yeah, I'm surprised by that because certainly I want to see, as I think you know, many of my colleagues want to see, land reform legislation completed in this term. And they also, I also want to see this legislation completed in this term and the most efficient and effective use of resource uh, you know, given that a lot of this regulation, the legislation will come to this committee, will be to have them within the same bill. But there's also a very strong connection between them. Uh, I mean, I do think Scott's language is unfortunate, uh, and I think regrettable, actually, because the connection between them is empowering communities and empowering individuals and redressing the balance in some of the power relationships that exist within parts of Scotland. And that's a positive agenda. It's not a negative agenda, and it's certainly not a negative agenda for Scots members. And I'm you know, go back to the fact that we should all be saying that and having that conversation. But I don't actually see physically how you can run those two bills in the next 12 months. And, you know, uh, I think Sarah's agreeing that, and both of us are ex-ministers. I just don't see how that could be done. And there is a commitment to do both of those. So the most efficient and effective use of resource is to do it in a single bill. But I would not accept a bill that excluded uh, any of these items uh, from it. Scott Walker. Um, I think there is general consensus that we want an ag holdings bill to be delivered this par par parliament term. And I think, as, as people have mentioned, there's actually a great deal of consensus amongst all the industry bodies on the main elements of that, that ag holdings bill. So we want that bill, bill to be delivered. Um, again, I can only speak for NFU Scot Scotland members in the discussions that, that we've had around the country with regards to land reform and regard to ag, ag holdings. And perhaps it's confusion on our part or our members' part, but our members certainly have concerns about some of the land reform bills. Some of it they think is excellent, some of it will be very good, but they've got a lot more concerns about the land reform bill Whereas the Ag Holdings Bill, people could see the direction of travel. They know what's, what's to be, be delivered there. So in terms of confidence for farmers, and I'm purely talking about farmers, you know, we would prefer to see the two, two se separated, maybe going through at the same, same time, but there, it would be helpful if it was separate in people's mindset. I, I see you shaking your heads, and you'll know far more than me about what's possible within, within the par parliamentary terms. But that, that would be our wish, if it was at all possible. Okay. Alec Ferguson. Just for the record, Convener, and thank you for the opportunity. I, I, my, my concern is not so much getting it through by March 2016 as getting it right, uh, both in the land reform debate and indeed in the agricultural holdings debate. Um, both of those bills will come to this committee for, for scrutiny. Um, uh, uh, we, we haven't got that long to go in this Parliament for these very, very weighty subjects. Um, they, they are not without controversy, don't let's pretend they are. Um, to get this particular piece of legislation right has the enormous prize of restoring the faith and confidence that we've been talking about in the sector. That has to be the principal aim, in my view, uh, and I, I really worry um, about the prospect of, of, scrutiny, of delivering the process of scrutiny properly and, and correctly if this is put in to another bill. And I simply put that for the record. Thank you all. Um, let me say that, uh, as you know, we could hardly be said to have not given this whole matter 
a large amount of scrutiny, uh, including today. And uh, this is one of many times that we've had to talk through uh, this matter. And indeed, when we take evidence at stage one in whatever shape the bill looks, there will be another further wide-ranging review of people's attitudes at that time. I would just finally like to thank the witnesses for the diverse views that we have round the table, but to point out that it is all set in the context of the common good of this country, and that indeed the public interest, which has been emphasised by the Land Reform Review, and indeed is underpinning uh, the way in which agriculture contributes to that common good, is something that we take very seriously indeed, and we will try our very best to make sure that we get the kind of outcome that will be satisfactory and will be progressive, indeed even radical, and sometimes uh, the word was used earlier. I hope that uh, it's one that's going to make Scotland a better place at the end of it, and uh, I believe that it will. So thank you very much. We're going to have to close the meeting just now, but before I do so, I must say that on the 1st of April of all days, the committee will consider five negative instruments, taking further evidence from the agricultural holdings legislation, uh, from the review group with the Cabinet Secretary for uh, the uh, Rural Affairs and uh, Food and Environment. And the committee will also consider a petition PE01490 on the control of wild geese numbers and consider its future work programme. So, you know, we could do with a, an extension day and the number of hours of the day. I have to close the public part of the meeting now. I have you to ask you to leave very quickly. We have two further items that we have to deal with. And thank you very much for that. I close the meeting publicly.